Oh, we're going to learn some cutting edge NFT building techniques today. Hi all, this is going to be an end to end NFT creation tutorial. And we're going to use an especially special technique introduced to me by the Oni Chain NFT project. They have this insanely cool way to use Chainlink VRF to generate programmatically random, truly random images on chain, 100% on chain. And we're going to give to you this superpower. So in this video, we're going to do a quick rundown of what an NFT is and tell you the differences between this video and my last long video on NFTs. Do a quick start of the repo and the code that I've already built for this tutorial. Then we're gonna build this entire NFT project from scratch, explaining you along the way, of course, how we're doing everything. Then we're gonna deploy this to a testnet blockchain and see what these images and these NFTs would look like on OpenSea. And then we will deploy to a real live blockchain because so many people have been asking how to do that. And then of course, if we wanted to, we could start selling it on OpenSea. And for those of you who have been like, Patrick, where you been, man? Like we've been missing you. Stick around to the end, I got an update for you. So let's do the quick NFT refresher here. If you're new to NFTs and these acronyms are kind of giving you nightmares in this cryptocurrency blockchain space, definitely go check out my glorious guide to NFTs video. There's a link in the description. It'll give you everything you need to know to watch this video. And it's a lot of fun and I think my jokes are pretty good. Now I also have another tutorial that goes over how to deploy, create and sell NFTs. And it's got so many views, I'm so proud of it. But this one is gonna be a lot different in a number of ways. First off, we're gonna be hosting our metadata right on the blockchain instead of on IPFS. We're also gonna be using Hardhat and JavaScript instead of Browning and Python. And we're gonna randomize our NFT art 100% with on-chain interaction. Now, a few notes on these points. If you're looking at this first point saying, metadata, IPFS, what, what is he talking about? Don't worry, we'll explain metadata as we go along. <sighs> but like, go watch my glorious guide video to explain it in there, God. For number two, yes, I know, I did the unthinkable. I coded in JavaScript. <laughs> I think I'm gonna be sick. And as much as I hate JavaScript, I think the hard hat tool is pretty phenomenal and the team has done an amazing job to make this tool really usable, even in the disgusting swamp JavaScript is. And number three, well, you'll see. For those of you who like Python and wanna see a little bit more of the traditional way that these NFTs are hosted and generated, definitely go watch my other tutorial. That other tutorial uses Brownie, it uses IPFS. It is an absolutely fantastic tutorial. We are gonna go into the pros and cons of using the method we're gonna use here and the method we used over there uh, in this video. But in any case, I think both of these techniques are fantastic for creating your NFTs. Per usual, first we're gonna go into the quick start showing you how to use the repo that I've already created and showing you exactly what we're looking to build. And then we're gonna jump in to building the code and everything 100% from scratch, explaining along the way everything that we're doing. So, are you feeling froggy? Let's jump in. You can find everything that we're looking to work with on my GitHub. There will be a link in the description for how to work with and how to build everything on here. There's a readme you can follow along with. Now to get this repo into our VS code, again, I'm working with Visual Studio Code, but you can use whatever text editor that you want. We're first gonna need to have Git installed. So we can check that with Git dash dash version. I do indeed have Git installed. We'll then wanna come to my GitHub here. Again, the link for this is in the description. And in here we'll do Git clone, paste that in. We'll CD all on chain generated NFT and all of our code will be in here. Now we'll also need yarn. Uh, we can check to see if we have that installed with yarn dash dash version. We also need node.js dash dash version or node dash dash version. Again, in the readme, it'll teach you how to install all these. We'll also need hard hat installed. Again, readme to, to do that as well. And we'll just download everything in here with yarn. And then I also have this hard hat shorthand autocomplete. You can install with npm i dash g uh, hard hat shorthand, or you can do yarn add global hard hat shorthand. I already have it installed, so I'm not going to run that. You'll know you've done it right if you can do hh dash dash help. This shorthand is literally the exact same thing as just doing mpx hard hat dash dash help. So we have two contracts that we're going to be working with. Random SVG .soul and SVG NFT .soul. Random SVG .soul gives us a randomized image that's built with an SVG. And SVG NFT is, is the more simple one that we're gonna start with first that creates an NFT based off of the SVG that we go ahead and give it. So what is this SVG thing that we're talking about here? 
SVG stands for Scalar Vector Graphics, and it's just the type of image that we're going to be working with. As we dig deeper into the code, you'll see why we're using an SVG here. SVG code is a way to programmatically command something to draw what an image looks like. So for example, all this code over here defines what this frog on the right should look like. And to get started, we're going to go ahead and deploy them onto a local blockchain of our own. But to deploy this to a local chain, we'll do, we'll do hard hat deploy or MPX hard hat deploy, and it'll spit out all this stuff. So this is simulating as if we ran this on a real blockchain. Well, first thing that we do is we deploy an NFT, uh, an SVG NFT. This is kind of the, the simpler one to a blockchain and it gives us this token URI. And if we paste this first token URI into our browser here, we'll get the metadata for this object. And again, all this metadata is being stored directly on chain. A quick refresher here. Metadata has a name, a description, some attributes, and then it has the image URI, which defines what this image looks like. You'll see this is very different from like an HTTPS URL, right? We have this data image, SVG plus XML, base64, and then a whole bunch of random stuff. So this URL defines what this image looks like. And if I paste that in the browser, I get a blue circle, right? This is a really simple NFT generated with this SVG. So that's the first bit. The second bit that we can see is our randomized SVG. So what this will do is it actually will deploy an NFT that was generated programmatically on chain and with randomness. So again, we have this little output here. This is the, the token URI for this NFT. You can paste it in and we get this massive metadata piece here. And I'll grab this image URI, copy, paste it in and we can see this is the image that was randomly generated. Obviously it's just a bunch of lines and doesn't really look like anything, but that's because we said, hey, randomness, go have fun, go be random. And that's what we get. Now we can go ahead, deploy this to something like Rinkby by doing hard hat deploy dash dash network Rinkby. And of course, to deploy this to Rinkby, there are a couple of requirements. Yeah, NPM, yarn, um, we also need a couple environment variables, a Rinkby RPC URL, basically a way to connect to Rinkby, or excuse me, a private key that has both Chainlink and uh, ETH in it, ETH and Link. You can always find the most up-to-date faucets by going to Link Token Contracts. Just search that, come to here and look up Rinkby. You can always find the most up-to-date faucets on this page uh, to get it into your, your MetaMask here. And then we'll just go ahead and hit enter and deploy this to Rinkby. I should spell network, right? And what this will do, it'll deploy both of these contracts to the Rinkby testnet, and then it will also mint an NFT. So, right, so these NFT contracts are factory contracts that create our, our collections, right? The main contract defines the collection, and every time we hit mint, we mint an NFT of that collection. Uh, we also get this nice little verify with. So while this transaction is going through, which of course we're going to have to wait a little bit, I'm going to create a new terminal. I'm going to paste this verify script. I'm going to go ahead and hit enter, and we're going to go ahead and verify this. Now, I've already verified this code a couple of times, uh, and Etherscan is smart enough to recognize that this code's already been verified, so um, it, it'll already automatically be verified. But in order for you to verify it, make sure you have your your Etherscan API key, and there's a little link in the readme if you're learning how to, to get that. So let's go back to this. Oh, we've made our first NFT. So if we go to this contract address in Rinkby now, Rinkby Etherscan, paste it in. You can indeed see there's a contract here called SVG NFT. We go check out the token URI, that's zero with one and we see that exact same thing. Now what we can do is we can grab this address, go to Rinkby OpenSea, and depending on how fast OpenSea is here, we can paste that address in here, and we do indeed see that there's an item in here called SVG NFT2, and one of these NFTs is minted, 
and boom, we can see exactly what this NFT looks like. Um, and it's that blue circle that we, uh, we minted, right? The reason that it's this blue circle is because in our code here, we have, we're minting this small enough dot SVG. And if you look in here, it's exactly, it's exactly that. A really simple SVG code saying, hey, we're gonna have height and width of 500. It's gonna be a circle. Here are kind of the, the parameters to define a circle and that's it. And that's exactly what got minted. So, so that one went through. Now the random SVG is being minted. Uh, the random SVG probably already also got verified, but let's grab this verify uh, function. We'll paste it and we'll see if we can verify this as well. Cool, we're gonna go ahead and start verifying this contract, which we can go back to rank the ether scan. We'll paste it in. We'll see it'll get verified once that verification completes. But we're gonna run a couple of different functions here. So first we deployed it, of course. Then we just verified it. Now we're gonna create an NFT calling the create function after we sent this contract some chain link token. And we will have to wait a little bit of time, probably a few minutes actually, because we're doing a number of transactions here. So this is your time to maybe go grab a cup of coffee or something. And so after a few minutes, I know there was, there was definitely a few minutes there that we had to wait, we'll get an output that looks like this. So we create our NFT contract and we created an NFT and whoops, this should just be zero. I should fix that later. We waited for the Chainlink VRF to respond to randomly mint our NFT. Then we called a finish mint function to finish mint in the function. Now again, we get an output like this. We can take this, pop it in to a browser, and then we'll grab this image URI to see what this random thing looks like. And boom, this is what we got. We just got a couple random green lines. Perfect. That's random. It doesn't look very creative here, but it'll show you the power of all the different things that you can do. And again, if we grab this address here, this contract address right here, we pop back onto OpenC, we paste that in, we scroll down, we can see there is a result here. We'll hit refresh metadata and we'll refresh. And we can see that the metadata and the image actually is here. Now just remember sometimes OpenSea is a little slow, sometimes RinkB is a little slow. So, so just be a little bit patient if they don't happen right away. But this is exactly what we're gonna do. This is what we're gonna be building. This way to both upload our own SVGs and upload our own random SVGs. I know I've shilled this protocol enough, but I was just so blown away by this application. They do kind of a mix of the two where they have some images, they have some SVGs already on chain and the random number actually just mixes and matches the SVGs to create all these different images, which is really cool. And you can check these out in OpenSea, all these different attributes like this eye patch, the hair color, their eyes, these are all SVGs on chain that are randomly selected by a chain link VRF. So this is the type of thing that you could build, which I think is absolutely stellar. So now that we know what we're looking to build and how we're looking to build it, let's get started building this entire thing from scratch. So I'm gonna to go to my demos folder. I'm gonna make DR all on chain generated NFT repo, CD all on chain generated repo. I'm gonna open this up in my VS code. Now, if you don't have VS Code, that's totally fine. This is just text editor that I'm gonna be working with here. Remember the first bits that we need to actually have installed are gonna be Node.js. So we can check if we have that with Node-S version. And we also need, we're gonna be using Yarn. So we'll do Yarn-S version. We're gonna need Hardhat. So we'll do, we'll make sure we have Hardhat with Hardhat dash dash help. Oh, and I'm just gonna go ahead and quit. Definitely have Hardhat installed. There's some links in the readme of this GitHub repository, again, in the description on how to download all these requirements. So great, so let's go ahead and get started by building a sample hardhat repository. So I'm just gonna do mpx, mpx hardhat, and we're gonna go ahead and say, create a sample project. We want the root to be right here. Yes, let's add a git ignore, we'll hit enter. Let's install some of those dependencies for us here. And great, we have our simple hardhat repository here. I'm actually gonna go ahead and remove delete package lock.json because I'm gonna use yarn uh, instead of npm. So in here, we have a couple simple contracts, some scripts. We're gonna be deleting a lot of this stuff, but 
there's some great videos on kind of the layout of hard hat that you can learn uh, in some other videos. So since we're making some contracts, we might as well start with the contracts. So we're gonna start with that SVG NFT. This is kind of the, the simplest starter bit. And then we'll go to that more advanced randomized SVG that we'll work with in a bit. So I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this contract here. Move to trash. All right, so let's go ahead and create our first contract. This is gonna be our SVG NFT dot soul. And let's talk a little bit about what we want this contract to be able to do. So we want to be able to give the contract some SVG code, which we're gonna go into how to actually generate this SVG code and working with this MVG, SVG code, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And it should output an NFT URI with this SVG code, storing all the NFT metadata on chain. Right, and this is gonna be this simple example of how we can do this SVG code. And then after we go through this simple example, then we'll do a random SVG, which will take this and level it up and make it explosively dynamic and way, way more unique and powerful and just, and just way more fun. So let's go ahead, let's jump in. Let's start building this Solidity smart contract. So we'll start with, of course, SPX, SPDEX, License Identifier, MIT, I just did a little tab complete there. I will try to do as few uh, tab completes as possible. We'll do Pragma, Solidity, Solidity 0 0.8.0. Uh, we're gonna be working with one of these newer versions of Solidity. We could do, really do any version, but let's just do, we'll just do 8.0. And we'll make our contract, which will be SVG NFT. And boom, that's it. Now we have our contract, yay. <laughs> Now I do have a solidity. Now I do have a, a solidity extension in here. Solidity uh, extension installed here to make it kind of format nicely and, and look like this. And we're going to close these because we're going to be focusing on the contracts now for a little bit. We're going to be building this as an ERC seven twenty one or an NFT. And of course, we don't want to have to reinvent the wheel, right? This ERC seven twenty one, this NFT standard, it's it's been done, right? It's been done a hundred times. So we can actually just borrow Open Zeppelin's ERC721 contracts to get started here. So we're, we're gonna go to their latest, their version 4.x, and we're gonna add it. We're gonna add these contracts in. It's actually yarn instead of NPM. It's the same thing though. Yarn add at Open Zeppelin slash contracts. And this is gonna enable us to kind of work with these pre-built smart contracts uh, that already have this NFT standard for us. So we're not gonna have to rewrite every single function needed in an NFT. This already has everything for us. So, and once we install it, as this thing kind of installs here, this is all we're gonna need to do uh, to make a really simple NFT. Obviously we're gonna do more than just this, but this is kind of the main piece. So we're gonna go ahead and import this Open Zeppelin code, this ERC721. Uh, however, even though I just said that, uh, we're actually gonna use one of Open Zeppelin's uh, extensions on this. And if we go to GitHub, Open Zeppelin GitHub, I just did Open Zeppelin GitHub twice. Uh, you can actually see all the different contracts that they have in here, all the different things that they offer. We're gonna go down to token, ERC721, because again, this is the NFT. We're gonna use one of their extensions. We're gonna use ERC721 URI storage just because it's a little bit easier for us to set and unset the token URI. You can use kind of this, their base model, their base model ERC721, and this actually has some really nice gas improvements, but for the simplicity of the tutorial, we're gonna use this extension uh, that just makes it easier from a developer's perspective. This ERC721 URI storage, it's the exact same thing as an ERC721. Uh, it just has a couple of added nice little functions for us to use. So back in our code. Let's get rid of this now. We're gonna do import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 721 slash extensions, because we're gonna use this, this extension that we're using ERC 721 URI storage.soul. We can even go to that contract. And here we're literally grabbing all this code and we're plopping at the top of our contract here, right? So it's got this token URI, 
Uh, it's got set token URI. It's got burn. It has all the functionality of ERC721. And what we're going to do is we're going to have our contract import that contract. So we're going to say contract SVG NFT is ERC721 URI storage. So just by doing this, this is Solidity's inheritance. We're saying our SVG NFT is importing everything that this contract has to offer, which again, it already has all the niceties uh, of making an NFT. Perfect. So now our, our linter here is giving us an issue because it's saying, hey, you need to you need to define some functions here, buddy. What are you doing? Um, so we're going to go ahead and do that, right? So first, we need to make our constructor, which again, the constructor is the method that's called the instant we deploy the smart contract. And if we look into the um, the docs for Open Zeppelin, we can see exactly what this constructor is going to look like. And all we need to do is give it a name and a symbol. This syntax here is saying, hey, we're using the constructor of the ERC721 as part of our constructor. So it's a little bit weird in that regard, I know, but that's what we're doing. We're giving it a name and a symbol. So we're going to say ERC721. We're going to name it SVG NFT, and we're going to give it a symbol of SVG NFT. Boom. This is going to be basically our contract uh, collectible or collection, right? So all the NFTs that we're, we're going to mint are going to be of type SVG NFT. So a lot of people say, hey, like, how do I, how do I mint a collection? This is the collection like so this would be contract board apes or contract crypto punks and then every time we mint one we're going to mint a type of crypto punk a type of board ape or in this regard a type of svg nft so let's go ahead and create that mint function that users can call to actually create themselves an nft so we're gonna call function function create and we'll give this and we'll have and we'll have this take a string memory SVG and we'll make this public. So we're going to pass this a public variable called SVG. And actually, I'm going to turn I'm going to turn this off for now. We're going to pass this in SVG. So let's let's talk about SVGs real quick. So here is an SVG tutorial, and I got a link to it in the description uh, from W3 Schools. It's fantastic. It teaches you pretty much everything you need to know. So if we were to try this out, we could see like what this SVG code looks like in HTML. And this is it, right? It's, it's basically these tags. It's very HTML similar, right? So in here we have a circle of width 100, height 100 uh, that gets created like this, right? And so there's all these different commands and these different paths that we can do to make these, uh, these SVGs. Now, one of the simplest ones uh, is this path thing where it just defines where a line is being drawn and it has all these commands like move to line to, and it's literally just like telling where to draw lines. Uh, and so here's an example of an SVG triangle, which we can, you know, click try ourselves. Uh, we can even play with it a little bit, right? So we have this move to 150 zero. These are coordinates. We have line 75, 200, line 75, 200, and then close here, right? So we can even mess with this a little bit. We do like 200 run, we see it, it shifts over a little bit, we can get rid of the Z, right, we'll see what happens. Uh, it looks like actually nothing happens, we can get rid of this part, we'll see what happens, it looks like the whole thing disappears, changing the shape of this, right, because these commands are, are, are being slightly different. Now we could add all these other parameters in here. Uh, but for the purpose of our demo, we're actually going to just use move to and line to uh, because both of these take two parameters. Right, so move to it takes two coordinates, line to it takes two coordinates, um, and some of the rest of these take a lot more coordinates. Uh, so we just wanted to keep it really simple. Each one of these has two commands, right? It's going to be an X and a Y for each one of these. Boom, really simple. And we can generate uh, different images with this lines, but this is where your creativity really comes in. You can go absolutely crazy with the rest of this. Um, you can use an SVG generator to do all this, um, but again, Link is in the description. So we're going to give this some SVG code, right? And let's even just take this, this triangle example here. Actually, I can just copy right here. We're, let's just take this triangle example and we'll create a new folder, new folder called image, new file, and we'll try triangle.svg and we'll just paste this, this, this triangle code in here. 
Now, the one thing the Web3 school uh, doesn't actually have is it does need um, this thing called this X, M, L, and S parameter in here, which kind of just defines where this is going to be hosted from. I'm just going to put in basically what are the defaults for this, which is going to be www, uh, excuse me, HTTP slash slash www.w3.org slash 2000 slash SVG. Now, I also have an extension um, called SVG viewer, this one right here, installed in my VS Code. And what I can do then is if I do Control P, or for those of you on Windows, you can do View Command Palette. That will work as well. Or Control P and then do this little carrot thing. And now we can do SVG viewer, uh, View SVG, and we can see exactly what this triangle looks like in this little viewer here. Right, and same thing, we can go ahead and edit this. We can make this like 200, right? And the triangle is gonna shift over. This is what we're gonna use to deploy. In the GitHub repository, we use a circle, but it doesn't really matter. You can use really whatever you want here. So we're gonna pass this SVG, this that code, to our function here. And with just by passing this SVG, we're gonna be able to store our NFT image, our NFT metadata directly on chain. Remember, in order to show one of these tokens, we're gonna to need its token URI, right? The token URI is gonna be the most important thing. So we're gonna to have to turn this SVG into one of these token URIs. Again, if you don't know what that is, definitely go check out that glorious guide NFT video. It will teach you everything you need to know. So we need to turn this into a token URI, a unique resource identifier. And we're gonna go ahead and, and do that right now. Now, so the first thing that we're gonna do in this create function is we're gonna to wanna to mint one of these NFTs to whoever calls this create function. So our ERC721 URI storage has a built-in function called safe mint, and it takes uh, an address owner and a token ID. So we're just gonna say message.sender, and some ID is gonna be uh, the token ID. So whenever we create an NFT, again, if this is a board ape, it's this safe mint function that's called that's gonna mint a specific one of those, or if this is a crypto punk, this is minting one of those crypto punks, we're gonna assign it to whoever calls this create function, and it needs a unique ID. So to keep track of all these different tokens, we're gonna to create a global variable, UN256, public token counter. We'll initialize it in our constructor to zero. We'll say token counter equals zero. And we'll just set the token ID of this safe mint to this token counter. And every time we mint one, we'll do token counter equals token counter plus one. So we'll just increment this token counter so that every time we mint one, we're gonna get a new token ID. Great. So we've minted our token here, but what's the token URI? What's the image URI? Right now it's totally blank, which doesn't really help us at all. So we're gonna to need to create a function that's gonna turn this SVG code, that's gonna turn this triangle code right here into one of those token URIs. And okay, I'll show you what this looks like. <laughs> Again, this token URI is what is gonna return some metadata on what these NFTs actually look like, okay? It's this function that will return, that will return something that looks like this, that will have the name, the description, the attributes, and then this, this image URI, right? Which in, in this example that I'm showing is gonna be something like this blue circle, right? But for us, it's gonna be a triangle because that's what we're doing in this demo here. Let's create a function that will turn this SVG into an image URI, right? Because we're gonna actually have to stick the image URI into the token URI. So this is actually a little backwards. We're gonna do the image URI first because the token URI includes the image URI. So let's create a function called SVG to image URI. And ideally, we should probably turn this into a library so anybody can use this. But uh, for now, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna code it ourselves here. So what this is gonna do, right, is it's gonna turn, like we said, this code, and let's even just put this all to one line here, and we'll do save the formatting so it actually does that. What we're gonna want this to do is we're gonna wanna turn this, this big old thing, uh, into that example image URI, right? And it looks like this. So we can actually um, look at kind of the format of what this image URI is gonna look like. So it's always gonna start like this. So it's gonna start with data, image, 
SVG plus XML, base 64. And all we need to do is we're just gonna take our code, this SVG code, and we need to base 64 encode it, and then just add that base 64 encoding here. So this would be like base 64 encoding. And that's gonna be our entire image URI, right? So if you look at this image URI here, you can see data, image, SVG, blah, 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 comma, then this big, huge string, right? All this is, this big string is a base 64 encoded version of that SVG code, okay? So that's all we need to do. So let's go ahead and, and do exactly that, right? We're gonna start, we're gonna say string memory base URL, it's gonna be equal to this data image SVG plus XML base 64. And that's gonna be our starting point right here. Now, all we have to do is, is concat our base 64 encoded version of this on top of our base URL, right? So we'll do string memory SVG base 64 encoded is gonna be equal to, and this is where we're gonna base 64 encode this bit here. So we're gonna get a little bit fancy here, uh, but in order for us to do this, we're actually gonna use this base64 dash soul GitHub repository, base64 soul GitHub. So definitely be sure to star this this repo. Oh, I'm not signed in, but definitely be sure to start this repo because it's, it's what we're using and it is very helpful. It's got some really helpful functions in here. It's got this base64 library for us to use. So we're gonna import this just by doing import base64 hyphen soul slash base64 dot soul. And of course, we're gonna add this with yarn add base64 hyphen soul. So we can actually have this in our project here. Boom, okay, perfect. And then we're gonna do, using this, this base64 library, we're gonna say base64 dot encode, because this, this wonderful library already does this base64 encoding function for us. And we're just gonna encode this string here. Now we have to actually do a little bit of weird conversion here. Uh, we have to first, we can't just do it like this. We have to first do avi.encode packed SVG. So we're, we're uh, encoding it with an ABI. Then we have to convert it to a string and we have to then convert it to a byte. So I know this looks like a whole lot of stuff here, oh, and this should be a semicolon, oops, and this should actually take a string memory SVG, sorry, uh, and we'll pass that SVG in here, right? So this is the base64 encoded version of our SVG, and this base64.encode, it returns a string, so I know this looks kind of crazy, but this is all we need to do to get turn this into a base64 encoding. And what this is gonna look like, it's gonna basically look like, uh, and if we go to our, we'll pull up an example here, this base64 encoded string is gonna look something like this, right? It's gonna be this super long, seemingly random chunk of letters, but our data image SVG plus XML base64 URI understands this to be, ah, okay, this is base64 encoded SVG. And I understand how these random numbers and letters actually work. So once we have these two, all we need to do is concat them together. So in order to do that, we can just do string image URI equals, and the way to concat strings in Solidity is doing this, this clever little string abi.encode packed base URL comma SVG base64 encoded. And then we cast it as a string. Oh, sorry, this should be string memory. Boom. Lovely. So right like this. This is how we concat these two strings together. Now this is going to look like, you know, it's going to look like this, comma, comma, this, this big string, right? So now this is what this sh should look like here. And we want our SVG to image URI to return this. So we're going to actually uh, do a, make this function a public pure, because it's actually not a view function, because it's not going to be reading anything off chain. So public pure, it's going to return string memory. And so then we can just say, 
return image URI. So now we have this SVG to image URI, and this is something that it approximately should be returning. Okay. So in our create function, then what we can do is we can just call this, right? So we can say string memory image URI equals SVG to image URI SVG. Now we have our image URI, right? So that's going to be something that looks like this. This isn't our token URI. Oh, now this one in particular actually won't work because I these these are just actually random numbers and letters, but something like this, this would work, right? This, however, isn't our token URI. This is just the image URI, right? The token URI looks like this and has that image URI inside of it. So we actually need to wrap this image URI that we just created on chain inside of this bigger thing here. So what we want to do then is we're going to create another function called format token URI. And this is going to take in this image URI that we just created as a parameter and create that, that JSON object that we just saw. So let's do it. So it's going to take a string memory image URI. And this is also going to be a public cure because it's not going to read any state. And it's just going to return string memory, right? Now we're going to do a little bit of fancy stuff here <laughs> as well. So since we know that this whole thing, again, needs to be this, this base 64 encoded, right? So we have this wonderful JSON object, but it's got to look like this, right? This is what the URL looks like to return this JSON object. We're going to do some fancy stuff, but let's make the JSON object uh, first, and then we'll worry about converting it to this, this base 64 encoded here. Since we're just going to be making a string here, we can just start it off, right? So if we look at here, we're going to need, okay, we're going to need a bracket and a name. So let's go ahead. We'll do brackets and name. We'll, uh, we'll put it in single quotes because it looks like we want to use a lot of double quotes in here. So we want a name for this, right? We'll, do, we'll call it SVG NFT. Great. Then we can do a comma description, comma description. What will this description be? An NFT based on an SVG. Great. We'll just literally copy paste that or you can type this out. So we just need this name, uh, description. What else do we need? Attributes, uh, that can be blanks. We'll do attributes or you could put stuff in here, you know, whatever you want to do. But then this image is, is the important thing, right? And let me even just, oops. We toggle where we wrap on just so that it's uh, so we can see everything here. So this image, image, and this is where we're going to put that image URI, right? So again, since we're concatenating thing here, we're going to do some concatenation in just a second. We'll do that comma. We'll put the image URI here. Do another comma, and then we'll start up the, that string again. So that's equivalent of kind of having that quote here. This is equivalent to that image URI variable. And then we have another quote, and then we can just end it with a closing bracket. Great. And to concatenate this, again, we'll just do abi.encode hacked. And this will be a string, uh, JSON, string memory JSON equals this guy right here. Oh, that's right, we gotta cast this to a string. Boom. Okay, cool. So this is will return an object that looks exactly like this, which is great. But we got to go one step further, we of course need to then convert this into its base 64 encoded version. So how do we actually do that? Well, we're going to not have this be a string, we're actually going to convert this to a bytes object here. And then let me even just uh, make this look a little nicer. So we'll do and we got to do I'm going to put these little single quotes in here. So slowly knows to concatenate everything which is what we want. Boom. Okay, cool. Now that looks, that looks good. So remember those single quotes in here. So we're going to have to make this a bytes. And what we're going to do is with this bytes object, we're going to uh, once again, base 64 dot encode. And we're going to just encode this whole thing here. That's base 64, base 64 dot encode. And then this is again going to turn, return one of these giant long strings here. And all we then have to do is concatenate this with kind of the beginning of this base URL. The base URL for this, for this JSON object is going to be a little bit different though. So we can do, we'll say um, string memory 
memory base URL. This one, instead of being data image, SVG, blah, 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 right? You can even just copy paste it. This is gonna be data application JSON, okay? So this is different, data application JSON. So this is saying, hey, this stuff here is a JSON object. It's not an image this time. And so what we're gonna do then is we're gonna do ABI. Once again, we're gonna concatenate this base URL with this big thing here that we just made. We're gonna concatenate them together. And then we're gonna cast it as a string afterwards. So we're gonna do that same thing, abi.encode pack, oops, packed, little bracket here, opening bracket, little closing bracket down here. Uh, whoops, and we're gonna do the base URL combined, oops. This is where having good formatting comes in, comes in really nicely. Um, this base URL and the rest of this. So we're combining this base URL, which is this guy right here, with the base64 encoded version of our JSON object. Perfect. And then we want to cast this whole thing as a string. Boom. And that's what we can return. So this is going to return literally something that looks like this, right? So it's going to return something like this, which is the URI for that JSON object for the token URI. So now we have a way to get our token URI. This is really cool. So what we can do now, back up in our create function, we're gonna take this function and we're gonna do, we'll do something like string memory token URI equals format token URI image URI, right? Because again, we're just passing um, our format token URI function, the image URI, so it can return this wonderful JSON object here. And this is showing us how we can actually update our token URI to be really whatever we wanna be, right? We have this attribute section where we can add some really cool attributes. Definitely go check out my NFT mix if you wanna see some other cool stuff with attributes or the Truffle Dungeons and Dragons repository. Links in the description for both of those. In any case, now that we've, we've created this token URI, we have this wonderful function because we're using the ERC URI storage called set token URI that we can call set token URI, and we can just say, okay, set this token URI to our token ID, right? This token counter. Oops, these are backwards. Token counter, token URI. We're saying, hey, for this specific ID, right? So board ape zero or CryptoPunk zero or SVG NFT zero, give it this token URI. It's gonna look like whatever this object returns. And then once we're done there, we're gonna increase the token counter amount by one. And then I'm just gonna do this, underscore SVG, make these underscore SVGs just because kind of I like having my parameters uh, start with like an underscore. It's just gonna bother me if I don't put it in here now. So just added those underscores. You don't have to, but it'll bother me. So, <laughs> so great, um, that's all we really need. We do wanna do one more thing to make our lives a lot easier when we're working with this, is we do wanna emit an event every time we create one of these NFTs. Uh, this will make our lives a lot better for migrating later on, uh, for testing, for doing a whole lot of stuff. So we're just going to do create an event. If you're unsure what events are, there's a link in the description to learn some more. Uh, but we're going to do an event created SVG NFT. We're going to do a UNT256 indexed token ID and a string token URI indexed token ID. And then when we create this, we're gonna emit, we're gonna emit this event, emit created SVG NFT, and we'll give it a this token counter and token URI. So yeah, events are really helpful. Um, I'm not gonna go too deep into them now. Okay, cool. So now we have this part done. So typically what I like to do is I like to build my deploy script because our deploy scripts will help us run our tests and often you know, you want to test your deployments as well. So to do this, um, I use a plugin called Hardhat Deploy. That's really helpful. Uh, this guy is a is an absolute beast, builds really, really cool stuff. Uh, we can go to the Hardhat documentation to check this out. Documentation, let's look up Hardhat Deploy, right? It's in their plugins down here. It's really, really helpful. And we'll just add it here with yarn 
add hard head deploy or yarn add dash dash dev hard head deploy. So we're only going to need this for dev work, right? Or you could just do, you know, npm install dash d, that works as well. And it's cool. So now what we can do is we create a deploy folder. And anytime we do mpx hard hat deploy, it'll run through everything in our deploy folder here, right? So if you're familiar with Truffle, this is similar to uh, the Truffle migrations here. Let's go ahead and build our deploy script. So we'll do 01 deploy svg nft.javascript. And this is going to have everything that we need to actually deploy this. Now, we, when we run this hard hat deploy script, hard hat's going to give us some really helpful things to help us understand how to deploy this. So uh, I'm going to type some stuff. It might be a little confusing. Don't worry, just stick with it. It'll make sense shortly. So we're going to do module, module dot exports equals an async function here. This is where some JavaScript um, knowledge comes into play. And we're going to add get named accounts. Uh, this is a hard hat deploy function that allows us to work with the deployer. We're going to do deployments. This will get us some really helpful things like logging brackets there, and then also get chain ID, uh, which is really helpful for testing versus test nets and, and doing a lot of really fancy stuff there. So this is an async function that we're going to describe down here. So for now, just think of this is how we're going to start this deploy function here. From this deployments, we're going to get two variables. We're going to get deploy and log uh, from our deployments bit. From get named accounts, we're going to grab deployer, deployer, which we're going to use to deploy. Uh, and this is going to be equal to await get named accounts. And I do have a an auto save auto format for my JavaScript. Hence, every time I hit save, it kind of reformats a little bit. And then we'll do const chain ID equals await get chain ID. So uh, I know there's a lot of stuff here. Don't worry, it'll make sense. So I really like this log thing because I can just type stuff like log. Uh, and this is basically console.log, right? So I, I like to kind of start my stuff with like a bunch of lines here in hard hat saying, hey, we're, we're getting started. We're, we're about to, shit's about to get real. All right, we're popping off now. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to deploy that SVG code. So we're going to say const SVG NFT equals await deploy, and this is all we need to do to deploy it, SVG NFT. And then we can add some parameters in here for how we want to deploy it. We're going to say from deployer, and we're going to do logging is true. So, okay, what's going on here? This deploy bit knows that all of our contracts are in this contract folder, and it's going to look for this SVG NFT, which it'll know, it'll grab from con this contract name, right? And it's going to return it from deployer, which is await get named accounts. What get named accounts does is it looks in our hard hat config for one of these named accounts. Right now, we don't have one. So we're going to add one in here. So in this module.exports thing, we're actually going to change the solidity to uh, 8.0. We're going to add this named accounts bit. So we're going to do named accounts like this. And we're going to say this deployer. We're going to give it a default of zero. Whenever we deploy from one of our mnemonics, it's always going to take the zero with one, right? Remember how in our MetaMasks, we can have a whole bunch of different accounts here, right? And these are all with the same mnemonic device. Well, by saying the deployer default is zero, we're saying account zero is going to be our default, this deployer here. Now, of course, the question then is, oh, okay, well, how does it know what our mnemonic is? Absolutely great question. Uh, we're going to define that in our networks. So we're going to do networks. Our default network is going to be hardhat. This is kind of our, our local test fake network here. And in hardhat, we're just going to have a little, a little blank nothing here. And we get automatically assigned a, a mnemonic here. But for something like Rinkeby, which we're going to work with later, we are going to need some accounts defined. And we'll get into this uh, in a little bit for now. We'll just we'll just leave it blank. Get named accounts, deployer is defaulting to zero. When we work with our hardhat network, it's going to give us a mnemonic and it's going to say work with account zero. 
So that's what we're doing here. We're saying from deployer, which is our zeroth account uh, in MetaMask. And actually, I didn't even uh, compile. I should have compiled way earlier. Uh, I guess I'll compile now, make sure everything's good. Okay, cool. Compilation finished successfully. So if something, if you run MPX hard hat to compile and it doesn't compile, you have an issue, uh, go back into the code, you know, rewatch some of this video and be sure to, to figure that out. Also, I did this thing called shorthand and autocomplete. You can use uh, npm i g uh, hard hat shorthand or yarn add global um, hard hat shorthand like this. And what you'll be able to do is stuff like hh compile. And this is the exact same thing as running npx hard hat compile, but obviously it's much faster because I can just do hard hat compile. Anyways, with that all being said, so we're deploying this SVG NFT. And then I usually do like to do a little log saying you have deployed an NFT contract to, we'll add this little variable thing in here, SVG NFT dot address. Cool. So we've gone ahead and deployed it. We can even test this in here by just running hard hat deploy or MPX hard hat deploy. Oops, I forgot to add this require hard hat deploy in our config here. So let's go back to our config. We'll scroll the top, require hard hat deploy, right? And let's try hard hat deploy again. And this should run this deploy script on kind of our fake network and perfect, right? So if you're getting this, that means things are compiling. Your script is working so far up to this point. However, we want to just add everything in this, in this little script here, right? We could break out, you know, creating and SVG to image URI into kind of their own deploy scripts or their own tasks or whatever, but we're just going to add everything right in here. So the next thing that we're going to need to do then is we're going to need to call this create function with some SVG code. So we're going to save our SVG code again in this image triangle.svg. Feel free to add really whatever you want here. Just remember to add this XML, uh, ML and S bit here, because this is going to be an important piece um, for our code to actually really understand what's going on here. Once we have it in here, we can just read from this file uh, to get our SVG. So we'll do let SVG equals fs.read file sync. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, add this fs in here. So we'll do const fs equals require fs. And then we'll do yarn add fs in our terminal. We can work with fs, great, that's in there now. So we'll do svg equals fs.readfilesync, and we'll say, we'll let the file path equal dot slash image slash, you know, whatever you have here, do triangle.svg. So we're gonna read that file path with encoding of utf8. And for this, I found it's it's best to just kind of have it at one line. Don't use a new line or else it'll get confused here. So just, just make sure it kind of looks like that. Now we'll have our SVG read in and we're gonna call svg.create, right? We're gonna call this, this create function by passing in this SVG thing here. So this is what we're gonna pass to our created uh, SVG contract. So now that we have this deployed, we're gonna actually need to go ahead and, and work with it. So. We're gonna do a couple things here. We're gonna do const SVG NFT contract equals await ethers dot get contract factory SVG NFT. Let's get rid of this SVG NFT. So we're gonna to need to work with ethers here. What this is gonna do, it's gonna get us kind of all the contract information about this SVG NFT uh, contract. Now to grab that, we're gonna to need to go back into our hardhead config. And at the top, we're gonna to have to do require at nomic labs slash hardhat ethers. And we're gonna go ahead and grab this, pop on a new, a new terminal again, and yarn add at nomic labs hardhat ethers here. None of the, one of these wonderful plugins. And then we're also gonna to wanna to do yarn add ethers so we can work with this ethers package and we'll just test to see if everything's working with our hard hat deploy. Great, things are working spectacularly. Once we have the contract here, we're gonna add a signer. 
So we want to count to sign our transactions. So we'll say const signer equals accounts of zero. And let's get our counts actually from const accounts equals await chari dot ethers dot get signers. HRE stands for the hard hat runtime environment built in whenever we run one of these hard hat scripts. That ethers dot get signers. This again just grabs one of these uh, these accounts kind of similar to a deployer. The reason that we got to do all this extra stuff is because this technically isn't part of the deployment process. This is like extra stuff that we're doing. We could do all this in a script, but we're kind of lazy. We're engineers. You know, we want to automate everything. Now we're gonna do const SVG NFT. Right? We're not quite done there. Is gonna be a new ethers dot contract, and this is gonna have this SVG contracts. Uh, interface and ABI and all the functions. It's going to have this, this signer here uh, and it's going to have the address. So this is the line that actually gets us like an SVG NFT that makes it easy to make transactions. So we're going to say it's the SVG NFT dot address SVG NFT contract dot interface. And then we're going to do one more thing. We're going to get a network name. And this is actually going to come from a network config that we're going to go ahead and define. So typically what, what I like to do, and this is something I actually pulled from Aave, is uh, along with our hardhat config, we'll make a helper hardhat config.js. And in here we'll have a, a, a lot of wonderful little uh, helpful tips. And we'll have something in here called network config, which will just have some uh, helpful variables for each different uh, network. For example, network 31337. This is the hardhat network. We're going to give it a, a name, a name here of localhost. And then for something like uh, RinkB, which we're going to work with later, as a chain ID of four, we're going to give that a name of RinkB. But we'll get to that later. So at the bottom, we're just going to export this network config so that our deploy script can work with it. So we'll do module.exports equals network config. And then in here, oh, sorry, it keeps auto importing stuff. I don't want it to auto import, sorry. Um, back in here, we're gonna do, we're gonna grab that network config that we just made. So we'll say let network config equals require dot dot helper hardhead config. Now that we have this network config, we can get the network name by doing network config of that chain ID, right? And again, hardhead network is 31137 chain ID, and then we'll just grab the name. Now, the reason we're grabbing this network name here is because uh, typically when we deploy to an actual network, we're going to want to verify our contract. So this has a little green check mark. Having this green check mark on Ethers scan means that we can scroll down and we can see all the code in here. So we're going to want to make it so that EtherScan can get that little check mark. So I usually do a little logging here um, saying verify, verify with a little new line, and we'll say uh, mpx hardhat verify dash dash network that network name. And then this will be svg nft dot address. Then after this, typically, um, this is a plugin. We'll show you, I'll show you how to do this in a second. Typically, we also add the constructor arguments. If we go to our svg nft. This has no constructor arguments. So for this one, we can just do uh, exactly what we're doing here. Verify with this thing right here. So for example, if we did like hard hat deploy again, we're going to get this command that says mpx verify with mpx uh, hardhat verify dash dash network localhost since we're on hardhat and the address of that uh, svg nft contract that we just made. This obviously won't work on localhost, but it'll work on rinkb, coven, you know, mainnet, etc. We've deployed our svg nft. Nice. We have some svg code. We've done all this work to like get our contract. We've done some like verification stuff. Uh, let's actually go ahead and call this create function, right? Because we just deploying this contract will mint this factory contract, but we don't have any NFTs. This is basically our collectible, but this create function will create an instance of this collectible, right? So let's go ahead and do this. We'll go ahead now and we'll create uh, a transaction. So we'll say let uh, transaction 
response. Um, oftentimes you'll see uh, transaction response as, as TX. Sometimes you'll also see transaction receipt as TX, but um, this is gonna be a type transaction response equals await SVG NFT dot create. And we're gonna pass that SVG code. So SVG dot create is gonna take this uh, new ethers contract that we made, right? That's at this SVG address. It has the, the ABI slash interface of our SVG contract. And the signer is that deployer, that zero, excuse me, that zero with account in here. And we're gonna call, we're gonna make this transaction. Now what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna wait for that transaction to complete. So we're gonna say, uh, let a receipt or transaction receipt equals await uh, transaction res response dot wait one. We're gonna wait for one block for this transaction to go through. Then we'll do a quick log saying log, you've made an NFT. And then this create function, like we showed before, is gonna create us an NFT, bring it through this SVG to URI thing, and then format it to a token URI. So we're gonna be able to read that from the chain. We'll say log, uh, you can view the token URI here. And we'll do await SVG NFT dot token URI uh, of zero, right? Or uh, that first one that we create. So if we run this now, we're gonna deploy. We should see something that looks like this. Hey, you can view your token URI here because we're passing it our SVG code of triangle.svg, right? So everything's pre-populated and this is exactly what it'll look like if we were to do this on a real blockchain. So if we put this in here, uh, we get nothing. Ah, okay, I forgot a, a comma here, right? Base 64, it's gonna need a comma. So back in our function here, we just have to add this comma in here. Oh, my mistake. Let's try that again. Hard hat deploy. And okay, so now we can grab this, and copy this. Now that we, we have this comma here, we'll paste it in and we can see we do indeed get this JSON object, right? Name, SVG NFT, a description. Oh, it looks like we actually forgot a couple commas here, right? We have name, SVG NFT. This, there should be a comma here before description. Um, so this actually wouldn't render on OpenSea, but let's see if the the triangle is at least correct. Correct. Great. The triangle is at least correct. Uh, but let's go ahead and fix this. We need a comma here. We need a comma here. Let's look back. Where did we forget our commas? Ah, forgot a comma here. Description. We need a comma here. And we need a comma here. So we forgot a couple commas. Let's try this one more time. Hard head deploy. All right, here we go. One more time. We'll grab this, paste it in. There we go, much better. Name, SVG NFT, comma, description right here, comma, attributes, comma, image. Boom. Now this will render correctly on something like OpenSea. We do indeed see our little triangle here. So what do we do now? Well, we can now go ahead and deploy this to a real blockchain or a testnet blockchain. We are not gonna deploy this one to Polygon. We're gonna, we're gonna deploy our next example to Polygon. But how do we deploy this one to a testnet just to make sure that it actually would work on OpenSea? Well, we're gonna go back to our hard hat config and we're gonna add some stuff, right? Right now, our only network that we have any defined stuff in it is hard hat, right? But we're saying, hey, we're gonna to need to work with RinkB. So let's add some stuff in here. So let's add, first we'll add this RinkB network. I'm just gonna delete this for now. Uh, this again, RinkB is a, an Ethereum testnet for us to test for free what this would look like on a real chain. So we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna to deploy to this RinkB chain in here. And we need to do two things here. We need to give it a URL to connect to the RinkB chain. And then we also need to do, like I said before, this accounts thing. So the URL, we're gonna grab by getting uh, some environment variables. This URL is the way that we can connect to the RinkB blockchain. So I'm a big fan of using Alchemy, excuse me, uh, Al, Alchemy.com, is it .com? Yep, alchemy.com. What you can do is you can log in, create a new account. You'll get a dashboard that looks like this. We can hit create app. I'm gonna call this SVG, or I'm just gonna call this NFTs. 
description is going to be NFTs, development environment, Ethereum, and we're going to be on the Rinkby chain. When I hit create app here, it's going to give us this new network below. Again, I have a couple others up. We can click into it and we can hit view key. And this will give us an HTTP endpoint. Right? And, and this is what we're going to want to use. Now, here's the naive way of doing this is copying this and just putting some double quotes and pasting it in here. That is not what we're going to do. Um, that's really bad. You never want to hard code these into your, into your code. Instead, we're going to set it as an environment variable, which is a lot better. Uh, I, for, for any serious project, I don't put it in a .env file, but a .env file is an easy way to set environment variables. We have a link in the description to learn more about environment variables and setting them uh, safely. We're going to go ahead and use this .env method uh, for the time being. And in here, we're going to add rinkb rpc url equals single quote, and then we'll paste this in here. And I'm going to delete this. I'm going to delete this key right after this video so uh, nobody can steal it. Now we have this environment variable back in our hardhat config. What we can do is we can grab this environment variable by doing const or consistent const rinkb rpc url equals process process.env dot rinkb rpc url. And then we're going to do this other thing uh, called require.env. So we're going to do require.env.config. We're going to, this line will load all the environment variables from our .env and we'll be able to use this RPC URL. And now we can copy paste this here. And now we're able to connect to the Rinkby blockchain to deploy smart contracts to it. So cool. We do have to add this .env bit here. So we're going to do yarn add .env and perfect. Now we are able to work with our .env file um, and we're able to grab this rinkb RPC URL so that's not hard coded in our, our, our code here. Now what do we need to do? Well, the other thing we need to do is we need an account. We need something that is able to, that has rinkb Ethereum and eventually rinkb link. So we're going to do accounts and we're going to be pulling our accounts from our mnemonic phrase. We're going to call it mnemonic. Uh, again, we're going to create this uh, environment variable called mnemonic that's going to have our mnemonic. And then we'll grab it with const mnemonic equals process.env.mnemonic. So again, in our .env, we're going to do mnemonic equals, and this is where we're going to put our mnemonic, like frog, cat, dog, you know, whatever. Where can we find our mnemonic? Well, great question, young person who's asking me this question. Um, go to your MetaMask, right? You're going to want to need a MetaMask and you're going to need some testnet rinkb ETH and some, uh, not for this part, but eventually we'll need some testnet rinkb link. Uh, whenever I'm looking for testnet faucets, I always go to this. I always just do link token contracts in Google. This link token contracts in the Chainlink doc shows up and it always has the latest faucets and their locations for each testnet. So I'm going to look for rinkb and we have great. Testnet ETH is available here. We'll click this. We'll send a tweet and we'll get some ether with a tweet we send. So we, we, we create like a tweet. We post the link to the tweet in here. We hit give me ether and it'll give us some ether, uh, which is a lot of fun. And then we'll get some, some rinkb ETH here. Again, the reason we're using rinkb is because OpenSea has a test net that works with rinkb to test everything that we're doing. Again, I've already got a whole bunch of ETH in here, so we're good to go. Then you'll want to grab your mnemonic by clicking this, settings, security and privacy, and then hit reveal secret recovery phrase. Something that I never ever do is when I'm testing, I never work with a real wallet, okay? So for testing here, work, create a new wallet, a brand new wallet, um, so you can have a brand new mnemonic phrase. If you just create a new account, it's still gonna have the same mnemonic. If you're in MetaMask, you're like, oh, okay, I'll just hit create account. It will still have the same mnemonic here. Right? So you're going to want to create a new profile, get, you know, import a new MetaMask, whatever, right? Just, I highly recommend using a different MetaMask and a different mnemonic from your production one and from any uh, MetaMask that has real money in it. So we're going to need a MetaMask. There's a link in the description to download MetaMask if you don't have it. And remember, we're going to need to be on this RinkB test network, right? We, we can't be on main. We're going to be working with RinkB. So we need the RinkB ETH and later on the RinkB link.
So once we have that and we put our mnemonic in here, I'm just going to delete it for now because I already have this test mnemonic set as an environment variable, but you're going to want to put it in here. Once we have that in our config, we can just do mnemonic, we'll pull it in from our environment variable like so. Uh, the last thing I, I like to do here is I like to do save deployments to be true so that we save all of our deployments. One more thing in our dot env. Uh, remember how in here we do this little verify thing. Well, in order to do this verify thing, we're going to need to add this hardhead etherscan. Yes, there's a whole lot of these plugins that we that we do. So to do it, we can do npm install dash save devs at Nomic Labs right here, or we can just do what I'm going to do, which is yarn add dash dash dev at Nomic Labs slash hardhead etherscan. We'll paste it in while that's downloading. We're going to grab this require statement and add it to our hardhead config.js. So back in a hardhead config, I'm going to do op, op, require at nomic labs slash hardhead etherscan, put that into the top, and then we have to add this little etherscan bit. So um, I'm actually just going to do it raw in our hardhead.config. We're going to do etherscan and then API key. Oops, API key. And this is where we add our etherscan API key. If, you're, if your brain's going a million miles per hour and you're already getting ahead of me, you might already be thinking, ah, okay, well, I'm probably gonna set that in my ENV. You're absolutely right. So we can go to etherscan, etherscan. We can sign in. We can go to this developers. This is optional, but it's something nice to do. We can sign in and you can create an API key. Um, so they have some pretty good docs on creating an API key, but once you have that, you'll just put that API key in right here. And then we can do the same thing with etherscan. We'll say, uh, we'll scroll up to the top, we'll do, const etherscan api key equals process dot env dot etherscan api key and then we'll grab this and the api key will it be this etherscan api key and we need to come here and now with this piece and the api key which again mine's already set so i'm just gonna i'm gonna delete it for now all right we've got a whole lot of stuff going on so now that we've added all this in here we can now deploy this contract to the rink B chain. How do we do that? Well, my friend, we just do hard hat, or if you didn't install the shorthand, mpx hard hat deploy dash dash network rink B. That's it. We just add dash dash network rink B. Uh, whoops, I have accounts here twice. Let's, uh, let's undo that. Let's grab the save deployments bit put it outside of accounts. Now let's try that command again. And you can just hit up and you should be able to do everything fine. Let's, now let's hit enter. Perfect. Now we're actually deploying this to the rink B blockchain. If we grab this little transaction hash here, we go to rink B etherscan, paste that transaction hash in. We can see this is a transaction that's happening on rink B right now. And it came directly from our wallet and we can actually see that our mount went down, right? Cause it came right from here. Now this might take a few minutes to actually update. It looks like we already went through. So back in our code here, we see everything that just happened. You've deployed an NFT contract to here. We have our verify with bit point posted out. And if we did our ether scan API key and adding it to our config, right? We can just copy this line, paste it here. Looks like I did something here wrong as well. Ah, this should be uppercase. Try this again. And okay, now it's actually going through. So we're actually going to so uh, verify this contract that we just created. And right now, if we look at our contract, it says, hey, are you the creator? It's This is what your code looks like. It's just a bunch of random letters and numbers, which isn't helpful to us at all. Our verification went through correctly. But now if we reopen this page, we'll see, aha, we did it. It's verified. And it has all of that code in here that we just created, right? This is exactly our contract. So it's split up into the different files, right? All these different imports and stuff. But this is exactly what we just deployed, which is great because that means we can read some values on here. Uh, we can write some values on here. We can look at the code. You know, we can see transactions and everything. Additionally, what we did is in our deploy, in our deploy, we called create with an SVG and then it outputted a token URI of zero. So we can actually see that exactly what it outputted. We can go to contract, read contract. We can go to token URI. We'll pop that zero in here. And we'll see, aha, here is that exact token URI that we just created on chain. We'll grab this, 
Uh, we'll paste it into another window, which it's not going to work uh, well, uh, quite yet. We'll add the comma. We'll grab the rest. We'll paste that in there. And boom, this is the token URI that's on chain. Now we'll grab this image URI again, copy that, paste it into the browser. And this is what we should see on OpenSea with this contract. So what we can do is we can grab this address. We'll go to testnets.opensea.io. We'll paste this address into the search bar and OpenSea will go, hey, there's, there's something there. And it sees indeed that we have an NFT that we just deployed and it has a triangle here. If you don't see it here, you can hit refresh. Um, you might wanna go to my profile. Sometimes OpenSea is a little bit slow, but boom, we can see everything here, right? We can even see you know, an NFT based on an SVG. We can see the name. Everything we just deployed is here. So if you've made it this far, you've just done something insane. You've created an NFT on chain using ugh, JavaScript <laughs> that uh, it just uses SVGs and is 100% on chain. This is incredibly, incredibly powerful and incredibly awesome. However, uh, this isn't the only reason why we're here. Now, if you've reached this point in this coding journey, you should be incredibly, incredibly excited and proud of yourself because you've just done something amazing. You've created SVG entities on the blockchain. You've showed how to get them onto RinkD, onto a real testnet. Now, that method of deploying these NFTs to a chain is gonna be exactly the same as deploying to a Polygon or any other real chain, which we're gonna go into now. Now, what we're gonna do though, is we're gonna crank the dial up and we're gonna answer some more interesting questions. So these SVG NFTs are cool, but how do we know that they have any real value? Well, if we could just mint unlimited amounts of these and we get to pick the SVGs, then that's not really that cool, right? Anybody could just mint a copy of really any NFT. So to create a true amount of scarcity and a true amount of rarity to these NFTs, we can add some randomization to what these SVGs actually look like. This is one of the issues that is currently there for trading cards, for example. The company behind those trading cards could mint as many of those super rare cards as they want, and you would never know the wiser. We're gonna introduce a method that will guarantee the randomness of the SVGs that we're gonna make, and we're gonna randomize these SVGs. With this method, we'll also learn how we can layer these images on top of each other by using this SVG method. We can layer different paths, combine them into one SVG, and pop it on the blockchain. So that's what we're gonna do now. Number one, we're gonna randomize our SVGs now. Number two, we're gonna learn how to be a little bit more creative and layering with these NFTs. And number three, we're gonna deploy this to a real blockchain. We're gonna deploy this to the Polygon blockchain, a real mainnet. And this is gonna be incredibly cheap. And then number four, a lot of people say, how do I do a 10,000 NFT drop? We're gonna learn how to do that as well. So stay tuned. Let's get into part two. Oh, and then ideally we write some tests for this as well. We have this sample test in here. I'm just gonna delete this for now. We're not gonna go over the testing in here. However, if you go into the readme, we will have some tests for both this SVG and our randomized SVG that we're gonna do. Now, let's jump into this more advanced NFT method of creating true scarcity, true randomness, adding this layering component, randomizing our SVGs, and then deploying to a real chain, deploying to the Polygon blockchain. Polygon is a blockchain that is currently supported by OpenSea, so we should be able to see it immediately on OpenSea as well. Are you ready? Because I am. Let's jump in. So we're gonna start by creating a new contract. We're gonna call it random svg.sol. And we're gonna get started really similarly to how we did our last piece. So I'm gonna skip over um, talking about the same functions we talked about last time. So let's just get started. SPDX license identifier MIT, pragma solidity 0 0.8.0. We're gonna call this contract random SVG, oops, and boom. Now, this is gonna be using that same ERC721 storage.sol, so we can even just copy this, paste it in here, and we're gonna say this contract is ERC721 URI storage. Let's go ahead and create our constructor here. Constructor. 
And same as the SVG NFT, we're going to give it a name and a token symbol. So we can literally just copy paste that. I have the little brackets here. Our name is going to be different. We're going to call it random SVG. And the symbol is going to be R S NFT. So random SVG NFT. That's our little name for it. Cool. Now we are going to have to add a whole bunch of these other functions in here, but let's do this step by step, right? Let's do this one at a time. So instead of us having our create function add an SVG here, we are going to generate a randomized SVG, right? So if we go back to our web three tutorials here, right? For SVG, we're going to scroll down to path, right? Cause this is going to be, um, this is going to be the way that we're going to do our randomness. You can use your randomness with really any of the things in here, but um, you'll see why in a second, uh, why we're going to use path because path is, is really easy. So again, with our triangle, we'll try this ourselves. We're really just going to be working with this move and this, these line two commands, right? We're not going to work with Z at all. And this is going to look exactly the same. So we could do some more lines, we do a hundred, you know, a hundred, we'll run it. It would look like this. We do another line. Maybe we'll do line 25, 25, 24, and it'll just be keep doing lines like that, right? So we're going to set this up so that this path command is going to be randomized between um, these these move to and these draw line commands, right? So we're going to flip between between the two of those, and so this is how we're going to randomize this. We could also add multiple paths. Uh, and we can change this. We'll do like move zero, 500, you know, line to 25, 123, or for, for 200. And then we'll do another line, maybe 100, 100. Cool, we'll get something that looks like this, right? So we're gonna do some different paths, right? The more of these paths, the more that they're gonna stack on top of each other. We can also give them a fill or a color, for example, like we could call her this blue. And now it shows up as blue, or we could do red. And it shows up as red. So we'll have these be different colors. We're also gonna do, for our fills, we're just gonna do transparent, and then stroke equals blue. So we're gonna have the fill be transparent. However, the lines are gonna be colored, right? And so that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have them all be transparent, but we're gonna have some lines, but you can see we have all these different commands that we can use to kind of make this more and more random as we go along. But this is basically what we're going to do. So how do we get this started? Well, let's go ahead and get this started with a create function. So we'll do function, function, create. And this time it's going to take no parameters because we want this SVG to be randomly created. We don't want to have to pass it anything. We want this, these, these to come up naturally. So we're going to say, have this create function and how are we going to do this? What's this create function actually going to do? This will be a public function. So anybody can do this. Well, we're going to want this to get a random number. Use that random number to generate some random SVG code. Then we're going to want a base 64 and code the SVG code. And then get the token URI. Token URI and mint the NFT. Boom, that's what we wanna do here. Now, there is an issue with randomness on the blockchain. So a lot of people, when they work with randomness or when they work with, or they think about randomness on chain, you know, in, in JavaScript or, or Python or whatever, you'll do something like math.random, right? Now you actually can't do this on a blockchain uh, and get true randomness. You can only get what's called pseudo randomness doing something like this. Or you might see a lot of people do like, Kakak, um, you know, block dot difficulty or something like that. This will get you a pseudo random number. And I've seen it time and time again, people using a randomness method like this, and them getting hacked and losing, you know, any and all money that they put into their projects. So we want a, a way to get true randomness. However, blockchains are deterministic. Uh, that's definitely not how you spell it, but they're deterministic, which means that by definition, they themselves can't actually get random numbers. So we need to look outside the blockchain to get a random number. This is where oracles come into play. And in particular, Chainlink VRF or Chainlink verifiably or verifiable 
randomness function, which is a way for us to get a truly random number. So we can head over to docs.chain.link. We'll scroll down to using randomness, get a random number, and we'll see some code here. This is what we'll use to actually get one of these random numbers here. Since we're actually looking off chain to get a random number, it's actually gonna happen in two transactions, this chain link VRF. So I'll have a link in the description to these documentations for you to take a look at it a little bit more to learn some more how this actually works. But in any case, how it works is in one function, we make a request to an off chain node, right? So in one transaction, the chain link node is gonna take this request, generate a random number, there's an on-chain contract called the VRF coordinator that's going to verifiably prove that the number is random. I know absolutely wild that you can do that. There's a little bit of cryptographic magic that goes on. If you want to check out the contracts, you absolutely should. Um, but in a second transaction, we're going to call this fulfill randomness function, and that's going to return our randomness function here. So this is a two transaction process. So our create function is actually just going to request a randomness. And then once we've returned that function, then we can actually you know, do everything that we need to do with our randomness. So let's go back to our contract. And the first thing that we need to do is get this random number here. So let's learn how to do this from the Chainlink documentation. So the first thing that we need to do here is we need to import some Chainlink contract code. And I know this, you know, this version is 0.6.6. Uh, we're gonna use this for the 0.8.8 .8 version. So we're literally gonna copy this line, scroll up to here. Oops, paste it in. This is import at chainlink slash contracts, SRC version 0.8, VRF consumer base dot soul. Then of course we have to add these at chainlink slash contracts. So we'll do yarn add at chainlink slash contracts, bada bing, bada boom. So now we have that. And then we have to inherit all the functionality with this is VR consumer base, right? The exact same way we're inheriting this ERC721. We're gonna inherit this VRF consumer base code as well. So we're going to do comma, VRF consumer base. Now this random SVG is both an ERC721 and it is Chainlink VRF uh, consumable or workable. In order to get a random number, we need to tell our contract where this VRF coordinator or this random number checker contract is. The Chainlink token, because these Chainlink oracles are paid in Oracle gas in the form of a Chainlink token to perform their service, and then a and then a key hash, which uniquely identifies which chain link node we're going to work with. And then the fee, which varies by network. Um, we're going to be paying 0.1 link uh, in Oracle gas to this chain link node to get this random number. Again, uh, all these numbers are different per chain. Uh, we're going to be working with Polygon, which is like 0.0001 link. So it's infinitesimally small. Similar to the ERC721, our VRF consumer base has this little constructor here. So we got to go ahead and grab this, this VRF consumer base, and add this constructor um, to our constructor, like so. Now, each chain that we work with is going to have a different VRF coordinator contract, a different link token contract, a different key hash, and a different fee. So we want to parameterize all these variables. And we can do that by passing them to our main constructor and then pass it from our constructor to the VRF consumer base constructor. Sounds like a mouthful. But don't worry, it'll make sense as we go along here. So let's let's even just kind of make this look a little bit nicer here. So first thing we need to do is we need a, a VRF coordinator, which we're going to pass to our constructor. We're going to say address underscore VRF coordinator. What else do we need? We need a link token. So we'll do an address underscore link token token. We need a key hash. And this is a bytes 32. So we'll say bytes 32, key, oops, key hash. And then we need this fee, which is a uint 256. So we'll do uint 256 underscore fee. Fee. And now we can pass this VRF coordinator and this link token to our VRF consumer base. So we're going to say VRF coordinator, boom, like that. Link token, boom, like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to save this key hash. We're going to save this key hash and this fee uh, as global variables here. So we're going to say byte 32 key hash, byte 32 public key hash. We'll do a UN256 public fee. 
And then in our constructor here, we'll do fee equals that fee. We'll do key hash equals key hash, right? Similar to how they're doing it here. Key hash fee random result. We're not going to save the random result yet, but we'll get there. So perfect. In the example here, it gives us um, it gives us a VRF coordinator link token key hash for the Coven network, but we're parameterizing it so we can work with any network that we want. Now, in our create function, this is going to call function. Ha! I should spell things correctly. This is going to call the Chainlink VRF, and in a second function, we're going to return that random number and do some stuff with it. So we're going to call that function by doing exactly what it says right here. Function get random number, public returns, blah, blah, blah. We're gonna do uh, something really similar to this. We're gonna say function create, it's gonna be public. It's gonna return bytes32 request the QUES ID, uh, returns bytes32 request ID uh, to get this random number. By saying bytes32 request ID, this is actually the same as initializing this request ID variable. So now we can just go ahead and say request ID equals request randomness, and we're gonna pass it that key hash and the fee that we got from our constructor, right? So with this, our contract needs to be funded with link to call this function. So you'll see how we do that when we get to the scripting section. But this is the main piece to get that random number. Once we get a random number, once it gets returned, it's gonna get returned to a different function called function fulfill randomness. The Chainlink VRF code is smart enough to know, okay, if somebody calls request randomness, I'm going to return in a second transaction to the fulfill randomness function. And this takes a bytes32 request ID. When we request randomness, we create this little request ID saying, hey, I am request number one, and when we return it, we say, hey, here's request number one. If somebody says, hey, I'm request number two. This will return with, hey, here's the answer for request number two. And it also returns a U and 256 random number, right? So it returns the request number and then that random number. Now this is gonna be an internal function. It's called an internal override because the VRF coordinator is actually gonna be the one to call this. Right? So we're not going to let other people call this function. Only the VRF coordinator is going to be the one to call this function. And it's overriding an implementation of fulfill randomness. We're saying, hey, this is going to be the real fulfill randomness function that you're going to want to call. Call our fulfill randomness. And cool. Once we return this random number to here, then we can go about our SVG business. Right? We can take that random number, generate a random SVG with it, and then do some stuff. So this is going to be that random number that we get. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to do something really similar to here. We're going to want to take this random number, turn it into a random SVG, and then do all this other stuff. Now there is an issue with this. There is an, an issue. Boom, 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 boom. Uh, the Chainlink VRF has a max gas of 200,000 gas or 200,000 computation units. What does this mean? This means that if what we do with this random number is sufficiently complex, the chain link node is going to go, ah, that's, that's really hard for me. That's going to be a lot of work. So what we're going to want to do instead is just say, hey, no problem, chain link node, just return the random number. We will deal with the heavy lifting. We will make the transaction. We will spend the gas to um, to do this. Uh, for context, we're probably going to do something like 2 million gas, uh, which is a lot of gas, but that's because we're doing a lot of heavy lifting on chain. Again, this method is great because we have all of our metadata on chain, uh, but it's not so great because it's definitely more expensive gas wise. So we're going to fulfill randomness this, and we're going to use this to just get a random number. And then we're going to create an additional function called function function finish mint, and this will be the function that actually does the rest of the work with our random number. So we'll call create, we'll request a random number, 
We'll get a random number back with fulfill randomness. And then later on, we'll call an additional function called finish mint because the chain link VRF is gonna have a hard time spending all this gas. So when a user creates requests randomness, we're gonna to wanna to map whoever called this function with their request ID. That way later on, when, we, when they get a random number, we can say, ah, okay, you were um, Patrick, you were request ID seven. Okay, cool. This was, uh, this was the random number that you got returned. And here's your token ID, right? So we're gonna say, we're gonna create a mapping called request ID to sender. We're gonna create this at the top here. We're gonna do mapping bytes 32 to, oops, to address. And for the demos, I just make everything public, but you could probably make this internal. Uh, public request ID to sender. And we're gonna say, okay, so the request ID, a request ID is gonna be equal to message.sender. So we're saying this request was initialized by whoever called this function. And now we can keep track of them and then assign them to the NFT later on. Then we're gonna to need to create a token ID for this new token that we're created. So we'll do unit 256 token ID equals some token counter, similar to last time, which we go need to go ahead and initialize. We'll do token counter equals zero. And at the top, you went 256 public token counter. Start it with zero, boom, token ID, token counter. Awesome. Once we get a token ID, we're gonna do another mapping. We're gonna map this token ID also with the request ID. Why? Because again, down here, we're gonna to need to say, okay, sender, here's your token ID. So we're gonna to need to also map that to our request ID. So we're gonna create a new mapping called request ID to token ID. We're gonna create this at the top. We'll do mapping bytes 32 to a UN256 public request ID to token ID. And we'll do request ID to token ID of that request ID. It's now gonna be mapped to this new token ID that we just created. We're then gonna increment the token counter, right? So we're gonna to say token counter equals token counter plus one so that we never have duplicate token counters. This is pretty much our whole function. We are gonna do one additional thing so that we can track this better, uh, we can test this better as well. So we are gonna do one of these events again, and we're gonna create an event called, uh, we're gonna emit an event called requested random SVG, and we'll give it a request ID, and a token ID, token ID, and that means at the top, we're gonna do an event requested random SVG, and we'll give this a bytes32 indexed request ID, and then a uint256 indexed token ID. Remember, indexing an event, indexing a parameter in an event just means it's gonna be a topic. And for the testing here, I'm not really too worried about gas, so we're just gonna index everything. Great, this function is done. Believe it or not, this function is done. However, this function was one of the easier parts. So we can make sure that we're doing things right. We can try harder hat compile. Let's see if we're great. We are on the path to glory. Things are compiling. This makes us very happy. These don't do anything, but it still compiles at least, <laughs> which is good. We've requested a random number. Great. Now that we've requested one, Chainlink node's gonna go, ah, oh, I got you. I'm gonna make a random number for you. I'm gonna return it to fulfill randomness. So what happens when we fulfill this randomness here? Well, we're gonna have to store this random number somewhere so that we can generate our random SVG. And then we'll call a function later on to generate that random SVG. So first in this fulfill randomness, we're gonna grab the address of the NFT owner, which is gonna be equal to this request ID to sender of this request ID, right? Because we have this request ID to sender. Up here, when we create the request, we say, okay, take ticket, you know, Patrick, you take ticket number zero. And then down here, when it says, hey, who's ticket number zero? I go, oh, that's me. And it goes, ah, here's your random number, ticket number zero. We also do the same thing for UN256, 
token ID, same thing, right? We have this request ID to token ID, request ID to token ID, request ID. Perfect. So that's how we can keep track of the token ID and the user who called this create function across these two, uh, this asynchronous function, if you will. Now that we have the owner and the token ID and the random number, we can go ahead and call safe mint NFT owner token ID. So in our svg.sol, we did the same thing, safe mint, message.sender, token counter. Uh, we just waited to mint the NFT until the random number was had, right? Because once we have the random number, there, there's it's we can't actually hack it. If we minted this NFT back in the create, um, it could be hacked a little bit easier. But now that we have the random number, exactly what the NFT looks like technically has already been done. We just haven't spent the gas to, to do that. And if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Just keep following along. Now we have a token ID, we have a random number, but we can't do this. We can't call this, you know, generate random SVG. We can't call this because this is going to cost a lot of gas. Chainlink node at the moment, depending on the network, uh, won't be able to handle that load. So we're just going to save, we're going to store this random number with the token ID so that we can do that computation later ourselves. So we're going to create another mapping, token ID to random number of token ID. It's going to equal to that random number that we just got. So of course, at the top, I'm going to do a mapping of UN256 to UN256 public token ID to random number. That way we have this mapping now. I'm also going to emit another event. Uh, it's really good practice, actually, whenever you do a mapping to emit an event. Uh, we might want to do one for these as well, but we're not going to. <laughs> we're just going to emit created unfinished random SVG. We're going to pass it the, the token ID and the random number. This takes a token ID and a random number. We're going to scroll up to the top, make another one of these event paste, we'll do a uint256 indexed token ID. And we don't really need to index the random number. So we'll just do a uint256 random number. And then congrats, this is all we need to do here. That's our whole function. So let's see if this compiles with hh compile. Perfect, compiles fantastically. So now we can move on to finish mint, where this is going to be the bulk of what we do, right? So in our create function call, and I'm going to remove these comments here, just because uh, to make our code look a little bit nicer, we create by calling our requested randomness, right? We go ahead, we request a random number, we're going to reserve a token ID, we get it fulfilled, and we go ahead and mint and assign that token ID. We have this random number. All we have to do is finish using this random number to generate some random SVG stuff, right? We're gonna have this finish mint function and it's gonna take a UN256 token ID. So we're gonna say, hey, we're gonna finish minting a specific token ID because it's got the random number, it's already been minted. All we gotta do is add the token URI to it really. So we gotta do a couple things. We have to check to see if it's been minted and a random number is returned, right? We got to check that. Then we're going to have to generate some random SVG code. Then we're going to have to turn that into an image URI. And then we're going to use that image URI to format into a token URI. And then we're all set here. So these are the main things that we have to do. Now we could do something like import, you know, dot slash, what is it? Um, SVG NFT dot soul and, you know, borrow those functions, but we're just going to go ahead and, and rewrite some of those functions again, just, just in case, you know, you skip to this section and, and you want to be able to follow along here. Let's go ahead and we'll do some checks here. So first thing we're going to do, we're going to require the bytes, bytes, of the token URI of the token ID dot length is 
excuse me, is less than or equal to zero. We're, we're gonna check first. This is gonna check to say, hey, is this token URI already set? If it is, we're gonna say, uh-uh, token URI is already all set. Can't do that. What are you doing? You've been crazy. So if it's already set, we're gonna not let them call this finishment function. Then we're gonna require the token counter is greater than the token ID. Because if this is less than the token ID, then we know that we're minting some crazy token that hasn't actually been minted yet. We're gonna say, hey, you need to be greater than the token ID, otherwise token ID has not been minted yet. And finally, we're gonna require token ID to random number of the token ID we're looking to finish is greater than zero. If it's not greater than zero, this means that the chain link, oops, the chain link VRF probably hasn't responded. So we'll say need to wait for chain link VRF. Cool. So we're checking to see if this has already been done. We're checking to see if this token ID even exists. And we're checking to see if a random number for that token ID exists. Perfect. Let's move on. So first thing we're going to need to do, we've done this checking bit. This is like, check, we did this first part, right? How do we, uh, we'll go like this, check, we did, we did this first part. Let's even, we'll, we'll blank these ones, right? Check, did the first part, awesome. Now we're going to generate some random SVG code. So first we're going to need that random number. So we'll do uint 256, random number, and this probably should have an underscore actually. Yeah, okay, we'll do an underscore, 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 underscore. Boom. We should probably do that for these two, but eh, whatever. It's not a big deal. You know, you can use kind of whatever code conventions that you want, but yeah, ideally you do underscores for those. But anyways, finishment. We're gonna need to get this random number from token ID to random number. Right? That mapping that we use up here, we're gonna use that again to just grab this random number back. And now we have this random number and we can use this as our seed to generate some SVG code. So let's do that. We'll do string memory SVG equals generate SVG. We of course don't have a generate SVG function, so we're probably gonna have to build one. Once we do generate this SVG, again, we're gonna do string memory image URI equals SVG to image URI SVG. And then once we have that image URI, we can go ahead and do string memory token URI equals format token URI, the image URI, right? So I know none of these functions are built yet. So don't worry, I'm just saying, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna get the SVG, turn it into an image URI, add that image URI to our token URI, then we're going to go ahead and set token URI of the token ID to this token URI. And then we'll go ahead, emit created random SVG. We're gonna give it a token ID and an SVG. So we're gonna emit this event that we haven't created yet. We'll go up here, event created random SVG. We'll give this a uint 256 indexed token ID and a string token URI. Okay, so I know none of these functions are built and it's going, what are you talking about? Oh, and this is like this, this is like this. It's going, this doesn't exist, this doesn't exist, this doesn't exist, but this is essentially what we're doing, right? So this is gonna generate some random SVG code. Then we're gonna turn that into an image URI with this line right here. Then with this line, we're gonna go ahead and use that image URI to foamer into a token URI, right? So these are the functions that are gonna do all of that. So let's build these functions one at a time. The main one that we're gonna focus on is generate SVG, right? Because SVG to image URI and format token URI are, ba ba ba. what do you know? SVG to image URI and format token URI, right? These are gonna be exactly the same. So we can copy paste them, or again, we could do the import thing, but we're not going to for this one. But uh, if you're going to do this in production, 
you know, that's a much better method. But anyways, I digress. So let's create this function, generate SVG. And then as far as the code goes, we're going to be home free. So it's going to take a UN256 random number. Uh, of course, this is going to be a public view function. And it's going to return a string memory. Uh, we'll call it final SVG. So we've initialized this final SVG, and that's what we're going to save to. So how do we create this random SVG? Well, this is the million dollar question here, right? So this is kind of the sample of, of how we're doing this stuff. Let's look back here and think how we want to do this. Well, let me even move this over. We're probably going to want a random number of paths, right? So because each one of these paths could be a different thing, right? We could make a red path here. Uh, we could do this like 0, 50, right? Run, get some different lines. Uh, each one of these, we want these different paths to make different lines. So we're going to give it uh, some a random number of paths. This hypothetically could be an infinite number of paths here, right? To save on some gas, we're going to cut down on the number of paths. We're going to create a max number of paths here. So at the top, this is something that we're going to do, right? Because we don't want this to be like a billion paths here, a billion of these different types of lines. We're just going to say, we're going to create a uint256 public. We're going to call it max number of paths. In our constructor, we'll set this to something like 10. We'll say at maximum, we'll do 10 paths, right? The bigger this number, the more gas we're going to have to spend because if we have, you know, a ton of paths here, right? If this is, if this ends up being our code, this is going to be very expensive to put on chain versus this is going to be a lot cheaper. So we'll just keep it maximized to 10. Then inside of here, we're going to have all these, these D commands, right? Telling us what to do. Same thing. We could get something like, you know, like this, which the more commands, the more expensive this is going to get as well. So we're going to want to create some maximum number of commands as well. Maximum number of path commands. So additionally, uh, with, max number of paths, we're going to do uint256 public max number of path commands. And for now, we're just going to hard code it to five max number of path commands equals five. We're also going to want to pick the height and the width. So they have it to these, we're just going to do 500. We're going to create another variable here. And then we can even label this, we'll say these are the SVG param meters, right? Like so, we'll do a UN256 uh, public size. We'll say size equals 500, right? So we'll default to 500, 500. We'll choose the path commands that we want to use, right? Because remember, we have all of these, but we're just going to keep it simple. We're just going to use just these two, move to inline two because they both take only two parameters. So we're going to create a little string array called path commands. So we'll do string array public path commands. And you'll notice this isn't storage, or excuse me, this isn't memory, because this actually is in storage here. So we'll have this path commands up here. And ideally, we probably would want to make this immutable to save on gas. But again, eh, you do gas optimizations another time. And down in our constructor, we'll do path commands equals M comma L because we only want to do the move to and line to. And let's also prioritize some of these different stroke colors like blue, red, etc. So we'll create one more string array, public colors. And we'll do colors equals, we'll do red blue, green, yellow, black, and white. So these are going to be the max number of colors, the max paths, the size, the max commands, and all this stuff. 
we could hypothetically go insane with this, right? And make this, you know, way bigger. We could make more paths, more commands, more path commands, more colors, whatever we want. Um, and it would just increase the number of variations that we can get. With this right here, we already have uh, a ton of variations that we can get because we're going to be choosing some random number of paths uh, with some random parameters, with some random colors. Uh, we already have, we're already like millions and millions and millions of, of different um, combinations here. So I'm happy with how random this is going to be. Now that we've identified the types of commands that we're going to use for this SVG, let's go ahead and, and gener generate some of this SVG stuff. So first, let's get the number of paths that we're going to use, right? Let's use this random number to pick one, pick a, you know, a number of paths, a uint 256 number of paths. And the way we're going to get this number is by taking our random number and doing this mod function. So we're going to do random number mod max number of paths uh, plus one so that it always has at least one path. What this mod function is going to do is it's going to do what's called, you know, modulo arithmetic. So let's say, you know, you had 100 divided by 10. Well, 100 divided by 10 is going to be 10. This divides evenly. There's no remainder. So 100 mod 10, it's going to be 10 would be equal to zero. However, if we were to do like 100 divided by 11, or excuse me, sorry, 101 divided by 10, we would get like 10 point something. And the remainder would be one, right? These divide evenly, but there's going to be one that doesn't divide evenly. So 101 mod 10 is going to be equal to one. There's one remainder. There's one left over, right? Similarly, you know, 102 mod 10 was going to be two. However, 110 mod 10 is going to be back to zero because these divide evenly. So that's how the module function works. And that's how we can pick a random number out of our max paths to get kind of what we're going to get, right? So our max paths is what? It's 10. So we're going to get between one and 10 here, one and 10 paths. And that's how we're going to get our random paths. So now that we have the paths, right? Let me, let me just boop, 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 boop. undo all this. Now that we have the number of paths that we're going to get, let's go ahead and start, you know, building this SVG. So we're going to do final SVG. Again, it's already been initialized with our little returns function here. Final SVG is going to be equal to a string that's going to start with, again, what do we, what do we do for this one? It's going to need to start with this SVG tag, XML and S and this, oops, uh, XML and S, this, this thing right here. So I'm literally going to copy that, go back over here, paste it in. And we're going to want to take these double quotes and turn them into single quotes. Uh, for the solidity here. So yeah, so anything inside of these double quotes is going to be single quotes, right? So these are all going to be single quotes instead of double quotes. And then we're going to say, uh, inside this little SVG bracket, we're going to do height and width. So height is going to be equal to, we're going to do another, another single quote here. And we're going to do a little comma because we're going to do some string concatenation here, comma, size, right? We want this to be 500. However, size is a uint 256 and not a string. So we're going to actually have to create a function called uint 256 to string. And I'm just going to copy paste that. Uh, I'm not actually going to show you guys how to do that. Uh, I copy pasted this from Stack Overflow. So I'm, I'm literally just, I'm not, I'm not going to walk you through this. This is the function I'm using from uh, uint to string. And we're going to wrap this size into uint to string. Uh, link in the description on how to get this, this function here. There's a Stack Overflow question. You know, if you literally just Google, you know, convert uint to string and solidity, you'll come across this. It has this, this function here, which is what we're using. And uh, yeah, you use this. So copy paste it into your code. Uh, I think ideally this will eventually turn into a library, but for now, just copy paste it.
you went to string of the size. We're going to go back to some string stuff here. And then I'm going to turn on, oops, I'm going to turn toggle word wrap on just so that it, it wraps around and it's a little easier to see. But these are all still on the same line, as you can see, kind of with VS Code here. So we'll do a comma here. So we'll just do a width equals, we'll do a single quote, close that off, comma. Again, you went to string size, comma. We'll start back the string up, and then we'll close this bracket like this. So of course, since we're doing this string concatenation, we're going to do abi.encode packed. Open and close bracket like this, a little semicolon there. This is just going to be basically this, this first line, right? With that XML and S equals, you know, whatever, blah, 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 blah. So cool. We have this first line here. We're going to need to add the paths. We're going to need to add the closing tag. But for now, we have the first line. Great. Now, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to loop through this number of paths and we're going to generate a random path from, again, this random number. So to loop through this, we're going to do a for loop. We'll say for uint i, we're going to start with zero. i is going to be less than number of paths, i plus plus. This is how you do like what's called a for loop in computer science. Um, you can just Google like what is a for loop if you're unfamiliar with this. But now we're going to generate a random path for each path. However, I want a slightly different random number for each one of these paths. Uh, otherwise, it might generate the same path for every single one. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this expand uh, concept, which um, you can actually learn about again in the best practices here, how to get basically multiple random numbers from a single random number. So we'll do something like uint 256 new rng equals we're gonna do some crazy stuff uint 256 kekak 256 abi dot encode not encode packed random number i so i know there's you might be saying what the heck is going on here um basically we're we're hashing this kekak 256 is a hash function we're hashing this random number mixed with the, the path number that we're on into a new number, casting it as, as a u into 56 and saying, hey, this is our new random number. This is fine because nobody can snoop this, right? Nobody can say, oh, I know what this, this randomness is gonna be. You know, once we return the random number, it's already decided, it's already deterministic what this is gonna be and nobody, nobody can snoop this. So. This is a case where doing something like this is okay. You wouldn't want to do this, a method like this, on just the create function, because then some people could brute force and cheat and do some do some very nasty things. So once we have this new RNG, what we can do is we can generate the path with this new RNG, right? Because we're using one random number to get the number of paths. We're gonna use another random number to generate the path itself. So we're going to do string memory path SVG equals generate path. Yes, we're going to create a new function and we're going to pass it this, this new RNG here. And once we get the path generated, we're again going to do final SVG equals and we're going to concat this new path with our SVG. So we're going to say string, you know, abi.encode packed because this is how we concat in Solidity final SVG with the path SVG. So once we generate the path, which again, we're going to define this in a second, we concat them together. And we do that for all the different paths. Once we're done, we're going to do one, we're going to add a closing tag, right? So once we've, uh, once we've made all these paths and added them, we're just going to add this closing tag. And then we're, we're done, right? So then we can do final SVG equals string. Again, we're do, going to do some concatenation, abi.encode packed, final SVG, comma, and we're just going to do a closing SVG tag. Whew. And this is what's going to get returned, right? Because in our function declaration, we said we're going to return some variable 
of type string memory called final SVG. And boom, this is it's going to be right here. All right, so now we just have to create this generate path command. And I got a hint for you. We got to do one more function after this. But we're so close. We're right there. So we're going to do function. Let's find this, this generate path. This is going to take a uint256 random number. And what's this going to do? It's going to be a public view that returns a string memory path SVG. Beautiful. And we're going to do something really similar to this generate SVG code. So this, but we're going to focus just on generating the path piece here. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to pick how many commands that we want, right? So we picked the number of paths. Now we're going to pick the number of path commands inside of our path here. So we're going to do uint 256 number of path commands equals random number mod max number of path commands plus one. We're going to use the exact same methodology here. We're going to start our path SVG with this bit right here. Boom. So I'm even just going to copy this equals this. And of course, we're going to turn this into a single quote. And then once again, we're going to do a for loop through this number of commands, number of path commands. So we're going to do for uint i equals zero. i is less than number of path commands, i plus plus. And let's get into it. So we'll do string memory path command equals generate path command. And yep, you guessed it. We got another function. This is the function that we're going to have to make. But before that, once again, we're going to create a, a new random number. So we're going to do uint 256 new RNG again, which is going to be equal to this uint 256 kekak 256 abi.encode random number comma and we'll do we'll do size plus i plus i right so this random number uh, this random number will be different than this one uh, because we're going to hash that random number with the size plus i right so it's something totally different than what we're hashing with up there great and then we're going to take this new rng pass it to a function we have yet to build called generate path command do I spell this wrong? Kachak. Kachak, excuse me. Generate path command. Once we have this path command, once we have this random path command, we'll do path SVG equals string abi.encode packed path SVG comma path command. Okay, so once we have all the commands put together, we're going to add fill transparent and then a color. We'll do string memory color equals colors underscore ram dumb number random number mod colors dot length to get that random number or excuse me to get that random color and then we're gonna put it all together so we'll say this path svg right this whole path is going to be start with this, add those path commands, and then we're going to add this, the fill and the stroke color. So pass SVG is going to be a string. We're going to concatenate some string stuff and code packed path SVG comma. We'll do the single quotes inside of some double quotes. Fill equals transparent parent stroke equals and here's where we'll do comma we'll do that color that we just created and then we'll do the double quotes single quote we'll close this off okay and this path svg will get returned because again in our function declaration we're saying hey a variable named path svg is what you're going to return so we have one more command we got to do this generate path command so we'll do function generate path command you are, might start to suspect what this one's going to look like. This is going to take a uint 256 random number. This again will be a public view, and this is going to return a string memory path command. 
this one's going to be a little bit easier. All right, so we're going to grab our path command by doing once again our mod function. Right, we're going to look at all these path commands, which we only have two. We're going to do exactly what we did with colors, and we're just going to randomly pick one of the two using the mod function. Right, so this is index zero. This is index one. Sorry, I didn't explain what we did with the colors, but we modded it to get a number between zero, one, two, three, four, five, between zero and five. And if it's zero, it's red, one is blue, you know, green, yellow, black, etc. So we're gonna do the exact same thing down here. Path command equals path commands, random number mod path commands dot length. Once we have a path command, which again, it's just gonna be M or L, what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna to have to get some random parameters to add to it, right? Like how in here, this has the M has 150 and zero, L has 75, 200, some X and Y coordinates for these. So we're gonna do unit 256 parameter one is gonna be, once again, we're gonna use this random number to create another random number. So we'll do unit 256, check 256, abi.encode, random number and we'll do size times two or something like that right and we'll mod this by the size because we don't want this these parameters to be bigger than the size right so our max size right now is 500 if this went to like 5000 um our svg code would be like what are you talking about this is this is only 500 by 500. so we're going to do the same thing i'm literally just going to copy this line for parameter two, uh, but I'm gonna do size times two or size times three, just so that these are different. So this will be times two times three. We'll call this parameter two. And now we'll get the path command. And now we'll set the rest of this path command. We'll say path command. It's gonna be string abi.encode packed of itself, path command, comma, a space, right? Because we're going to do a little space in between these parameters. Again, we have parameter one, parameter two, but they're uints. We need to make them strings. So we're going to do uint to string, parameter one, comma, another space, uint to string, parameter two. And that's going to be all of our path commands here, right? And our generate path is going to go ahead and close off, you know, the path, add the fill transparent stroke and all that stuff. And oh my goodness, that is a lot of code that we just wrote. <laughs> that is a lot of code. So awesome though. Generate SVG is going to generate some paths, generate some random path commands. And oh my goodness, we have a way to generate some SVGs. This is gonna be some SVG that looks just like this triangle thing, right? Or just like this right here. Once we have this, we can do SVG to, to image URI and format token URI. And guess what? I'm just gonna copy paste. So SVG to token URI. If you didn't watch the original part of the video, just check out the GitHub that we're working with and copy this because I'm not gonna go over it again. <laughs> so we're gonna paste this uh, this function, SVG to image URI, and I'm, I'm even just going to delete these giant comments because it's making our code a little bit uh, less readable. We are doing this base64 stuff. So similar uh, to this first contract, we are going to copy this, this import bit, import base64-soul, right? So we can do that stuff. And then this is completed. Now we just got to copy this format to token URI function, which boom is right here. Add it in. We're going to delete this guy. We're going to format this a little bit nicer, move this back here. And oh my goodness, we have everything. Holy mackerel. Does this even compile though? Let's hope so. I'm praying it compiles. It doesn't compile. Where did I mess up? Compilation failed. Wrong argument count for function called. Three arguments given, but expected one. Ah, I missed a closing parenthesis here. And I think we're good. All right, I had to compile. And I had an extra one here. So this should just have three over here. Let's try this now. Oh my goodness. We have compiled. 
we have done it. Now we just got to write some deploy scripts. Let's do this. So we have our deploy SVG NFT. We're going to do a lot of similar stuff that we did in here. Luckily, we've already got our hardhat config set up. We've got some ENV set up. We're good to go. So let's go ahead. New file. Say O2 deploy random svg.sol. Okay, and let's get to work on deploying this. All right, so we're going to start exactly the same way. Module.exports equals async like this. Get named accounts. This is how we're going to get those accounts. Deployments. This is how we're going to do all of our deployments and get chain ID, which is important for getting a chain ID. And this is not a Solidity file. This is a JavaScript file. See, I, I didn't want to do JavaScript so bad. I just you know, would rather do Solidity. Anyways, um, <laughs> we're going to start this out the same way. So we'll do const deploy. We're going to add this new thing called get. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Log equals deployments. We'll do const deployer equals await, get named accounts, const chain ID equals await, get chain ID. Right, really similar, similar start here. Now we have to do a couple of different things here though. So in here, we said, okay, cool, now let's deploy, right? However, in, in this new contract, in this new SV or random SVG, when we deploy, we're passing some arguments, right? In our constructor, we're passing a VRF coordinator, a link token, a key hash, and a fee. And these change to chain to chain. So we're gonna need a way for us to, when we deploy, for us to know which of these that we're working with. Now, I'm gonna kind of quickly go over mocking. Uh, I'm not gonna go too deep into it, but if we are on a local chain, like hard hat, what is the link token address? What's the link token address? Well, the answer is, uh, answer, there is none. So what we're gonna do, so what we do is deploy a fake one. So we deploy a fake one for our local chain so we can test and work with it. But, but for real chains, we use the real ones. So that's what we have to do. When we're working on our local hard hat, we're gonna deploy a fake link token. This is called mocking. And if we're gonna work on a real chain, we're gonna use the real token, okay? So let's do that. So first we're gonna say if chain ID is equal to 31337, then this means, means we are on a local chain. This means we're on a local chain and we want to go ahead and deploy and, and work with some mock tokens, right? A mock VRF and a mock uh, link token, right? Because, right? because this contract, VRF coordinator, won't have been deployed. This link token also won't have been deployed. So we're going to deploy mock versions of that. Typically, I put all my mocks in a different deploy script called 00. zero deploymocks.javascript. Uh, and I have some stuff in here that says, okay, are you on a local chain? If yes, this is the script that will deploy those, those fake contracts. So uh, before we get into deploying our random SVG, we're gonna deploy some mocks. So we are gonna start this the exact same way, module.exports equals async, boom, get named accounts, Deployments, get chain ID, and let's do it. So we'll do const deploy, comma log. We'll grab those from deployments. We'll do const deployer from await get named accounts. And then we'll do const chain ID equals await get chain ID. So now, same thing, we're gonna say if chain ID is equal to 31337, if we're on that hard hat, local hard hat network, we'll do a quick log, local network detected, 
deploying Mox. And we'll go ahead and deploy that fake link token and that fake VRF coordinator mock. So these are contracts that we're gonna to have to deploy, a link token contract and a VRF coordinator contract. Right now, we don't have those uh, in our contracts folder, right? Right now, if we look in contracts, there's nothing in here. Normally what people will do is they'll create a new folder called test or tests, and that's where they'll go ahead and add these, um, uh, these, these bits in. I know that I uh, can just pull uh, a link token contract right from a chain link slash token package. So I'm just gonna do this link token dot uh, You can grab this, um, this test folder from, uh, there's a hard hat starter kit from GitHub right here that has in its deploy folder, or excuse me, in its contracts folder, it has a test folder. You can literally copy paste these, that'll work perfectly. Uh, or you can just you know follow along, do it like this. But literally all that's gonna be in here is you know SPDX, license identifier MIT. We're gonna use the original uh, link deployment. So we'll do pragma solidity caret 0 0.4.24. And we're just gonna do import at chainlink slash token slash contracts slash V0 contracts slash V0.4 slash link token dot sol. And that's all we need. This is going to import this link token, um, this link token contract that has all the link token stuff in it. We do, of course, need to add this then. Yarn add at chain link slash token so that this will work. And since we're using this 0.4 version of Solidity in here, we'll go to our hardhead config. We'll scroll to the bottom. Right now we only have one version of Solidity. We're gonna go ahead and change that. We're gonna turn this into a little bracket here. And we'll say compilers. And we'll give it a list of compilers in here. So first version is gonna be version, you know, 0 0.8.0, comma, version 0.4.0. 24. I know that we're actually going to use a couple different versions, so I'm just going to put them in here now. Version 0.6.6, comma, version 0.7.0. We're going to save, and this is how you can have compilers, you know, across different versions in your hard hat uh, stuff. So, boom, lovely. So we've imported the link token. Perfect. Now we're gonna do the same thing for the VRF coordinator or the VRF coordinator mock. So we'll do new file, VRF coordinator mock dot sol. And we're gonna do the same thing, you know, SPDX license identifier MIT, pragma solidity. This one's gonna be caret 0.6.0 or six or whatever you want to do or zero, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then we're going to do import. This one's actually going to be at chain link slash contracts slash SRC slash V 0.6 slash tests slash VRF core in a tour mock dot sol. And that's all we need. And don't worry about it if your linter freaks out here, it's don't worry about it, but that's all we need. Since we're gonna import these contracts, this is the same as just plopping this entire contract into this file. So now we have both a link token and a VRF coordinator mock, but they're also separate from kind of our main contracts and we know, ah, okay, these are really just for testing. So in our deploy mocks, now that we have those contracts, we can go ahead and deploy them. So we'll do const link token equals await deploy link token and we'll say from deployer comma log true great and then we're going to deploy the vrf coordinator mock we'll say const vrf or vrf core denator mock equals await deploy vrf core denator mock comma, from deployer, logs, true, 
And this one actually does take arguments. We can see if we go to GitHub, chain link contracts, contracts, SRC, V0.6, tests, VRF coordinator mock, you'll see in its constructor, it takes the link token address as its parameter. So we'll do that by doing args, and we'll just say link token dot address. And that's how we pass the address in. And that's really all we have to do. Log mocks deployed. Deployed. And then we're going to want to do this one last thing at the bottom, module.exports.tags. Uh, and we're going to do, we're going to add all S, uh, RSVG and SVG. Uh, what these tags will allow us to do is when we actually deploy any deploy script that's tagged with, you know, whatever tag we give it to do that, right? So if we did hard hat deploy dash dash tags SVG right now, all this would do would be deploy mocks. And actually, um, this is a good way to test to see if it's working. It looks like it's not working. Looks like I spelled link token wrong. Link token. Try that again, tags SVG. And perfect. This is this is exactly what we've done, and, and that's all we did. Because uh, this only ran the deploy mox script, because right now deploy mox is the only one with this SVG tag. I don't believe we added that in here. We'll add that to our um, deploy SVG in a minute, but this is kind of a really nice feature uh, for working with this, this deploy thing. Anyways, so now we have some mocks deployed in our deploy mocks. Now we can go back to our main, uh, you know, O2 of deploying this, this randomness thing. So if we're on the local chain, we're gonna wanna use those mocks that we deployed earlier. And this is where this, this get thing is gonna come in. So we're just gonna say let link token equals await get that link token that we already deployed, right? Isn't that convenient? We're just saying, hey, just, just grab it. We already deployed it, just, just go get it. Same thing with VRF core de nator mock. It's gonna be await get, you guessed it, VRF core de nator mock. Cool, and that's it. So, and that's all we have to do. Now, if we're not on a local chain, we're gonna to need to get the link token address and the VRF coordinator address. So outside of this, we're gonna initialize those variables. We'll say let link token address, comma, VRF coordinator address. Um, and in here, we're gonna say link token address equals Link token dot address, VRF coordinator address equals VRF coordinator coordinator VRF coordinator mock dot address. If we're not on a local chain, if we're on any other local chain, we're going to need these values stored somewhere. Where do you think we could find those? Ah, oh my goodness, Patrick, I remember we have a helper config that does exactly this. So what does this look like? Well, if we're on a local host, we don't need the link token and the VRF coordinator. If we're on RinkB, we are gonna need those. So we'll go to contract addresses of using randomness. We'll go down to RinkB. We have a link token and a link coordinator. So we'll grab this, we'll copy this link token address. And for network four, we'll say link token equals, or excuse me, link token is going to be, boom, that right there. VRF coordinator, and we have the link token and VRF coordinator for ring B. As we'll say, we'll grab this, that, this network config object, right, by uh, at the top of this. We'll say let network config equals require dot slash helper hardhat config. Now we'll have this network config in here and we'll say else 
link token address is going to equal to this network config at this chain ID's index of link token. And we're going to do the same thing for the VRF coordinator address. So we'll copy this, paste it here, and this will be VRF coordinator. Now we got to add, of course, the key hash and the fee. Now, if we're on a local network, these don't really matter. Um, so we don't have to do this kind of if stuff here, right? We can just do const key hash equals network config chain ID key hash const fee equals network config chain ID fee. And in our helper config, we're going to do key hash, which again, we're going to grab from right here, chain link documentation, we'll grab that key hash, pop it in here. So I need a comma right here. And then we'll do fee, which we're going to do 0 0.1 link, which is going to be 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, which again, this is in, you know, this is a jewels uh, slash way, you know, whatever you want to call it. And 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That means the decimal place is right here, right? So this is equivalent to 0 0.1 link for this. Perfect. Now, I usually just copy paste these two for the local host because again, for local host or hard hat, it doesn't matter. So now we have the fee. Now we've got all this stuff here because this constructor takes all these arguments. I'm just gonna combine them together into a variable called args. And I'm gonna say args, or let args equal this list, VRF, coordinator, oops, VRF, coordinator address, link token address, key hash, and fee. And we're gonna deploy these the exact same way uh, we deploy to everything else. So I like to do a little log here saying, hey, let's get it started. Let's get it started. Ha! Ah. We'll do const random SVG equals await deploy, and I know I'm, I'm oscillating between single and double quotes here, random SVG, comma, we'll do the args here. So we'll say again from deployer, args is gonna be this args list we just made, the arguments, and we're gonna say log true. So this, if we just do hard hat deploy, now it's gonna deploy everything. It's going to deploy a mox SVG NFT and a random NFT. If we just want to deploy this random NFT uh, and, and all the random NFT stuff, including the mox, we can just add this tag here to, to this deploy script. So we do module.exports, exports.tags equals, we'll say all and our SVG. And then while we're here, in our O1, we'll do module.exports.tags equals, we'll say all and uh, just SVG. So 01 will be SVG, uh, 02 will be RSVG. So we can do hard head deploy, dash dash tags, RSVG, and this will deploy the mocks because these have the RSVG tags and it'll deploy our RSVG. So let's go ahead and run this on the hard hat network. We'll see if this works. We're running into an issue. Deploy script.func is not a function because this is module that exports, not export, whoopsies. Let's try that again. Hard hat deploy, that's just tags RSVG. Chained ID is not a thing. So let's make this chain ID. Let's try that again. Got another error in here. What's it saying? Can I read property to hex string of undefined? I must have, oh, yep, here it is. That should be key hash. I'm clearly overtired here. And boom. Okay, cool. So this is where it's being deployed on a local hardhead network. Awesome. Are we done though? Absolutely not. <laughs> We're just getting started. 
So we'll do log, you have deployed your NFT contract. Yay. And we'll once again, we'll do that verification process. So we'll do const network name equals network config chain ID name. And then we'll do log Verify with slash m mpx hardhat verify dash dash network network name Oops. network name ran dumb svg dot address and we're gonna do some fancy stuff because uh, then we have to add all the arguments but we're gonna do args dot two string. So it's gonna take this, this list up here, turn this into a string, um, but we're gonna then replace, uh, this is with a little regex here, replace all the commas in that string with spaces. So that'll say, hey, this is how you're gonna verify it. We'll even run this again to make sure it works. Yep, verify with mpx hardhat is the contract address, and here are all the arguments for the constructor. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna to wanna to interact with this contract, right? We're gonna to wanna to call the create function. We're gonna to wanna to fund it with link. So we're gonna to wanna to interact with this random SVG. The first thing we need to do though, is we're gonna to need to fund this contract with some chain link token in order to use the chain link VRF. So we'll go ahead and do fund with link. So we'll say let network ID we're going to do await. So we're going to fund it with this, this fee amount, right? That's how much we're going to fund it with. Maybe, maybe double it, maybe that times two or something. Uh, we'll, we'll just go with, with the fee for now. So in order to do this, we're going to have to do const link token contract equals await ethers.contract, excuse me, await ethers.get contract factory of the link token token and then it's probably gonna yep it's gonna do that don't don't let it do that don't let it import uh, ethers for us here accounts equals await hardhat runtime environment hardhat runtime environment don't don't do headers please okay you're gonna do headers hardhat runtime environment dot ethers dot get signers Called signer equal signer equals accounts of zero. Then we'll do const link token equals new ethers dot contract of the link token address, link token address, link token contract dot interface and the signers, excuse me, and the signer. And what we're going to do is we're gonna do let funding transaction equal await link token dot transfer. We're gonna send RSVG dot address dot fee amount. We're gonna do fund uh, await fund transaction dot wait. We're gonna wait for one block to happen. Great. And now our contract will be funded with link. And that's all we have to do. All right, next. Now we're going to create an NFT by calling a random number. We are getting so close. So let's get our contract here. We'll do const random SVG contract equals await ethers.get contract factory random SVG. We can just do const random SVG equals new ethers dot contract uh, random SVG dot address random SVG contract dot interface and then sign it. And now we can just do let creation transaction equals to 
random SVG dot create. Uh, I'm also going to pass a gas limit. I know we haven't done that in the past, but uh, we're going to want to pass a gas limit here of 300,000. And we'll do creation tx dot wait for one. And we'll say let received equals creation tx dot wait. So we're waiting for this transaction to go through. Now we are going to do something special this, with this receipt here. With this receipt, we're going to grab the token ID. And you're going to see why we're going to need that in a minute. So in our random SVG, remember how we omitted some events? Right? On our create, we omitted an event that had the request ID and the token ID, uh, both, of them being, both of them being indexed. So I know that in this receipt's logging or in its events, from its topics, aka its indexed events, I can get that token ID from this transaction receipt. So I can do let token ID equals receipt dot events. And I know that this is the fourth event because I know the chain link code uh, also emits a whole bunch of events. So if you're working with other imported contracts, you just need to keep track of if and when they emitted events. But I know, and excuse me, um, topic zero is always gonna be kind of the hash of this whole thing. Topic one is this one, and then topic two is this token ID. So I can do dot topics two. We're also getting it use. But now that we have this token ID, what we can do is we can say, we can do a quick log and say, you've made your NFT. This is token number, and we'll do token ID dot two string, and then we'll say log, let's wait for the chain link node to respond. Because remember, we do have to wait for that second transaction to happen. Now, if we're on a local chain, there is no chain link node, right? So if we're on a local chain, we're just gonna pretend we're gonna mock that uh, there's a response. So we'll say if chain ID equals yeah, actually we'll do, it does not equal 31337, which again is, we're saying if it's not a local host, we're gonna do some stuff. Otherwise, we're gonna do some other stuff. So I'm actually gonna start with the local host stuff, even though it says, you know, even though this looks kind of backwards. So else, this is saying, if we are on a local chain, right? What do we wanna do? We're gonna say const VRF coordinator mock equals await deployments dot get VRF coordinator coordinator mock VRF coordinator equals await ethers dot get contract at VRF coordinator mock comma VRF coordinator mock dot address on my signer using that same signer we're always using and what we're going to do is we're going to pretend to be the vrf node ourselves so if we're on a local chain where there is no chain link node we're going to say we're going to be the chain link node we're going to be this dummy chain link node so we're going to say let uh, vrf tx equals await vrf core denator and now we're going to pretend to be the Chainlink VRF node and return this response back to our smart contract. So we can actually go check out this contract on GitHub, this VRF coordinator mock, again, contracts, Chainlink contracts, source v6, test, VRF coordinator mock. And the function that it actually uses to return through that VRF coordinator and return the random number is this function callback with randomness. So we're gonna to pretend to be the Chainlink node and call back with randomness here. So we're gonna give it a request ID, a random number, and the address of our consumer contract, which in our case is our random SVG. So we're gonna do it that by dot call back with randomness. And we're gonna to have to pass the request ID, randomness, and consumer contract. So the same way we got the token ID, right, in here, in our random SVG, we also are indexing the request ID right here. 
So we can grab this from the topics as well. So we'll do callback with randomness. I'm going to turn uh, toggle word wrap back on. Receipt.logs, the fourth event or the fourth log, which again, which I know up here we did events, but I just kind of want to show you that you can do events or logs. They're the exact same thing. Like I said, we know that this is the fourth log, aka the third index log or third index event dot topics and one, right? Because the first of the first index topic is always going to be the event itself. So the zero with index is the event itself. And then the first topic is going to be this request ID. Great. So that's the request ID. We'll give it a random number. In this case, we'll do 77777, right? Or whatever we want. And then we're going to pass it back to the random SVG dot address. Then we'll do await VRF TX dot wait one. And then our random number will have been returned. Right. So at this point, this function fulfill randomness will have been done. That token ID will now have a random number associated with it. So we can go ahead then and call this finish mint function. So we'll do a quick log saying, now let's finish the mint and we'll do let finish TX equals random SVG dot finish mint and we need to pass it we need to pass the token id that we just created which again we're getting from up here so we're going to pass the token id and this one we're also going to need to add a manual gas limit otherwise it might break and yep we're going to do a big number we're going to do two million so two one two three one two three two million for the gas limit then we'll do a wait finish tx dot wait to be included. Oh, and this this should also be an await. Excuse me. Uh, wait. And then our token URI should be complete, right? Because this finish mint, once this function goes through, should return us a token URI for that token. So then we can do log. You can view the token URI here. And await random SVG dot token URI of token ID, right, or zero. And that's it for us kind of mocking or pretending to be the chain link node. So this is going to be everything that we're going to need to do. Now is hardhead deploy dash dash tags RSVG. And we'll see if we did this little script right. And it looks like we didn't get contract factor is not a function factor re that should be a function let's try again this should also be factor re let's try this again and whoops we should not be doing this require my vs code was a little aggressive and just kept pulling that in so let's try this one more time creation tx wait is not a function we probably just yep we need to await this here and then we also need to await creation tx .wait. I'm going to add all these, these fun little awaits in here. And we have another issue. Here, if coordinator mock is not defined, coordinator mock. How about that? That one defined? Yep, that one looks like that's defined. A couple typos. And bada bing! So we have, we're gifted this output here. So we're saying verify with this verify. Again, I. You know, needed to, to make this a little bit nicer, but it's fine. Let's wait for the chain node to respond. Now let's finish the mint. And here is our token URI. So if we grab this, paste it into our browser, we do indeed see the metadata pop up. And we'll pop our image URI in here. It looks like we had an issue. Error on line one at column 614, opening and ending tag mismatch path line one in SVG. So if you get something like that, it means that we did something wrong. Ah, right here. This actually needs to be a backslash instead of just a closing point here. So let's go ahead and fix that. We'll go ahead and rerun this. Hard hit deploy dash dash tags. All right, let's try this again. We'll grab this token URI. We'll paste it in here. We'll see if this image URI looks good. We'll copy that. 
and boom, we have a random SVG created. Obviously, this is pseudo random because right now we're just always using 777, but it's a good way to test locally, you know, what this is going to be. Now that we've tested this locally, uh, we know that this is going to work. We'll add our code to do this on a real chain, and it's going to be pretty much the exact same as this, except we're not going to have to do any of this mocking stuff. So all the first thing that we need to do is we need to actually await for the chain link node to respond, right? We could add like a subscriber that listens for events. We're just going to take the dumb approach here and just wait some number of seconds. So the last time I tested this, Rinkby was being really slow. So we're just going to wait an obnoxious number of seconds to make sure we give it plenty of time. So we're going to do await new promise r set timeout r comma 18 one two three 18 zero one two three. This is basically time.sleep in Python. And we're going to wait for 180 seconds. Uh, we're just going to give the chain link node plenty of time to respond if we're working on a real chain. Then once we do that, we'll say log. Now let's finish the mint degree, similar to what we did down here. And then we'll do let finish TX equals await and MSVG that finish mint token ID comma again let's add this gas limit in here of two million and then we'll do await finish tx dot wait of one block and then this should be all done right this is a lot easier obviously because we're not mocking on our local blockchain right this is just like hey we're just interacting with the with the chain straight up so now we can just do log you can view the token URI here. Await random SVG dot token URI of zero, or excuse me, token ID. And that's it. So now we have all of our code in here to actually deploy this to a test set and to a mainnet. So let's go ahead and do that, right? So in our hard hat config, we already have all of our etherscan stuff, all of our rinkb scan, or excuse me, etherscan stuff and all of our rinkb stuff. Our MetaMask does indeed have eth, but remember we will need some testnet rinkb link as well to work with the Chainlink VRF. So again, just Google link token contracts, and this we can always find the latest faucets on this page. We'll just look for rinkb here. Great testnet link is available here. Boom, all I gotta do is Grab my address, pop it in here. I'm not a robot, send me a hundred test link or whatever it is, and we'll be able to see it in our MetaMask. If you don't see it in your MetaMask, you, it's because you probably didn't add the token. Um, what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna take this address here, copy it in here. You wanna hit add token, paste it in here, and link will show up. And I've already added it, so it says token already has been added it, but once you do that, link will pop up here uh, with all your link. Once we have our link and our Ethereum and our Rinkby, we can just go ahead and deploy this the exact same way. So we'll do a hard hat deploy dash dash network Rinkby dash dash tags RSVG. Now, since we're doing tags RSVG, it won't deploy our deploy SVG NFT, our other project, right? Because the tags aren't in RSV, RSVG, it's just SVG. The other thing it won't do is it won't deploy mocks. And this is really good because we don't wanna to have to waste the gas deploying the mocks here. This is because again, in this our deploy mock script, we're just saying if it's on a local chain, that's the only time we're deploying the mocks. So let's go ahead and we'll deploy this to ring B. So we are gonna to have to wait a little bit. So uh, now's a good time to go to the bathroom, grab a cup of coffee or, uh, or something like that. You're doing a number of things, right? We're first, gonna deploy our random uh, SVG contract. Then we're gonna fund it with some link token to work with the Chainlink VRF. Then we're gonna request uh, that random number by calling the create function. We're gonna have to wait a few minutes for the Chainlink node to respond. And once it does respond, we're gonna call the finish mint function. And once it's done, we'll have, you can view the two, uh, token URI here, and we should be able to pop that, that address of the token into OpenSea and see it on chain, which is incredibly exciting. 
And woo, after some time, we do indeed see this massive URI here. And we're saying, hey, it's been responded. So we know that this is the token URI that's actually on chain. So we can grab this, let's copy this, paste it into our browser. Okay, we do indeed see some stuff here. We'll grab that image URI, we'll paste it in, and we see this, and we know this is somewhere on chain. So I can go back to my output script here. I can, I can verify the contract if I want to. I'm not gonna bother for now. Deploying random R SVG to here, deployed at here with this much gas. Now we can go to testnets that opensea.io, paste that address in here, click here. We can see there's one result. It looks like there's nothing here right now. Let's go ahead and refresh the metadata. And after we refresh the page, we do indeed see our random, completely randomized image here. This is so exciting. Now, if you wanna take a break, now's a great time to take a break. However, I am gonna show you how to actually deploy this to a real blockchain because we are going to deploy this, excuse me, to the Polygon chain. Now to deploy this to the Polygon chain, all we have to do is add some network information for Polygon. That's it. Everything else stays the same. We do also have to do it in our helper config. So these are the two files that we have to change to add this. But before I do this, I want to uh, talk about two other important things and, and two questions that I get asked a lot. The first question is how to sell the NFTs and set the price. So this is the first question that we're gonna answer. How do we set the price of these NFTs before we actually launch this on a real chain? Well, if we go back to a random svg.soul, is right now anybody can call this create function. We can change this though, so that there's a fee associated with this create function. So what we can do is we can add a little require here. We could say require message.value uh, and message.value is how much people actually send is greater than or equal to some price, right? Some price that we set. And I'm gonna just say price. And then if they don't send enough money, we're gonna say, need to send more ETH. So we need to define this price variable. So we're gonna make this a global. We'll do UIT 256 public price. And right in our constructor, we could say price equals, you know, if we wanted this to cost one ETH, it'd be one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right? We do something like this. Or maybe we'll get rid of a zero, and this will be 0 0.1 ETH slash Matic slash Ava X, whatever. This is gonna be 1.1 of that. Let me just double check. Let me just double, let me just double check here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Perfect. You could even add like a set price function or something, uh, whatever you want, right? And that means in our O2 deploy randomness, we're gonna have to change our create function. We do creation transaction equals random rcg.create. We have to do a comma value of this much, right? So we're gonna have to send this amount with it. And then we also have to make this a public payable function. Additionally, you're probably gonna want to be able to withdraw this ETH. So we'll say function withdraw or withdraw public withdraw. Now we only want the owner of this function to be able to do this, right? So we're gonna add in a little only owner modifier. So we're gonna do modifier only owner. Require message.sender equals owner. Not owner, if they're not the owner. And then add the rest of the code here. We need to define an owner somewhere. So right in our constructor, well, actually right up at the top, we're gonna say address payable public owner, and we'll define owner equals message.sender. So whoever created this transaction, oh, and then we need to do address payable, 
oops, excuse me, owner equals message.sender. This is going to be a payable message.sender. And down back in our withdraw function, we're going to make this an only owner. And we'll say owner.transfer address this dot balance. And this should be public payable. So I know we just added this, this function in here so that we can pay. If you wanted, you could add like a function set price. That is an only owner function that changes the price. Uh, you can kind of do whatever you want. But for right now, we're just gonna say, okay, price is always gonna be zero, one ETH. Now, in our deployment, we're just gonna have to yep, add this bit here and we should be good to go. Let's just, uh, let's just double check that this works. Run it deploy. Looks like we ran into an issue. Ah, that's right. Uh, JavaScript hates numbers, so we'll put quotes around it. Let's try again. And boom, looks like we're successful here. Yes, this is absolutely 100% something you should test and write tests for. Like I said, we're gonna skip it for now, but something like this withdraw thing is really important to getting right, so definitely wanna write some tests. So, okay, cool. How to sell the NFTs and set the price. Boom, we just did that. Now. Another question we get is how to mint 10,000. How do we mint a, a ton of these, right? Well, what we can do is what you could do is instead of having every single person have to create, call this create function, right? Right now, when users call this create function, they are the ones fronting the cost of creating the NFT. But what you could do is you could call this create function and then you could have this create function mint all 10,000 NFTs using the random number from Chainlink, right? So remember how we did this, kick 256, uh, abi.encode random number i. Using this method, we could use this method, you know, 10,000 times and get 10,000 random numbers, just do a for loop behind all those random numbers and boom, we'd be good to go. So how do we mint 10,000? Well, all you have to do is call this mint function the safe mint function 10,000 times, right? So in our fulfill randomness, we'd get a random number. And in our finished mint, we would do like four, you went a, uh, a is less than, you know, 10,000, a plus plus. And you'd loop through that list and you'd loop through that list and you'd follow this through all 10,000 of those. So I know this is a little bit pseudo Cody, but um, this is essentially how you would do it. So that's the next question. Final question I always get, how to deploy to a main network? Well, I'm gonna show you how to deploy to Matic and it's gonna be the exact same way for deploying to mainnet, exact same process. We're gonna to have to add a new network, add a new network to our helper config, and then when we deploy, just change the network flag. So we're gonna use Matic here. So we can find our details or for Polygon, excuse me. We can do Polygon MetaMask. And we can find the details right here. So we're gonna first grab this URL here. Copy this, we'll go into here. Networks, we're gonna create a new network. Call this one Polygon, Polygon URL. is gonna be this URL right here. Accounts are gonna be accounts mnemonic, mnemonic, oh, I did this, I did the double accounts again, mnemonic, mnemonic, and we'll do save deployments is true. Boom, that's all we need to do for our hardhead config. Then we need to add some stuff in our uh, helper hardhead config. So if we go to the Polygon documentation or Matic documentation, we can see the URL, the chain ID is 137. So we'll do 137 here name will be Polygon. We need the link token, VRF coordinator, key hash and fee. We can go back to the link token contracts. We'll scroll up to Polygon or Matic. Oh, excuse me. We'll scroll to our random place, contract addresses. Ah, Polygon Matic is the first one, which is great. We'll grab this link token address. We'll do link token. Is this here? VRF coordinator is this one. So we'll say VRF coordinator is this right here. Key hash is here. So we'll say key hash. 
is that right there? And then we'll do phi. It's going to be 0 0.0001. So this is going to be 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then what is it? 1, 1, 2, 3, 4. So we're going to do 1, 2, 3, 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Three zeros, three zeros. Perfect. So this is going to be 0 0.1231 link. And that's all we have to do. So of course, I'm testing with a mnemonic that doesn't have any link or any any actual stuff in it, right? Because when I set this up in our hardhead config, I said, hey, don't do this with a mnemonic with any real money in it, right? Don't put in your .env file uh, a real mnemonic. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to add a real mnemonic um, as an environment variable just so I can deploy this script and then I'm going to remove it right away. So I am going to pause recording uh, as I do this. Now, actually, before I do that, I do want to point something out on working with Polygon and working with Link on Polygon. So Polygon has this thing called the Matic Bridge, which allows you to bridge your tokens from one chain to another, right? We can log in with MetaMask and log in with MetaMask, and it'll allow us to swap tokens over. The thing is, though, the Polygon Matic Bridge isn't ERC-677 compatible. So the token that we get, we can't actually use with Matic. Once we get the link token bridged over, we actually have to swap it using this peg swap application to swap it from to swap it from the Matic version of the link token to the real version of the link token. You might be a little confused, be like, hey, why are there two, two chain link tokens in here? This address here is gonna be the correct one. And the one that you get, you're gonna to wanna to use this swapper to, to swap it over. Um, there's also a video on this from link token contracts. Polygon, if this is confusing, you can watch this video. Um, it has the whole thing as well. Oh, oh, what do you know? That's me. I'm going to go off screen for a second, add my mnemonic in here so I can deploy this thematic and then we'll get it done. All right, I've gone ahead and added as an environment variable. Let's go ahead and deploy this to a real chain with real money. So we'll do hard hat deploy dash dash network polygon dash dash tags RSVG. And let's see if this works. And we actually got an error here. I cannot read two string of undefined. It looks like this took a little too long to actually make. And it looks like it actually got mad at me because my gas price wasn't set great. So th these are some of the things that you will sometimes have to finagle with. So uh, our create actually went through fine, uh, which is good. But our finish transaction did not. So we added a gas limit. Uh, we'd have to add like a gas price. We're just gonna add 20 guay as a gas price. So I know we're, we're creating a whole bunch of random SVGs here. I'm fine to create a whole bunch, I don't really care. I think this will cost me a solid $3. So I'm not too mad about this. So if we see, if we go down to token counter, we have five in here, so I, I minted a whole bunch, but uh, I just didn't finish uh, finish minting them, right? Because we ran into some weird JavaScript errors. And what we can do on Polygon Scan with our verified contract is we can just go down to this finish mint area. We'll go try to finish mint token ID zero. I'm gonna edit the gas fee, or excuse me, I'm gonna edit the gas price to being 20 guay, just to be crazy expensive, just so that we guarantee it's gonna go through. We'll view our transaction now. And it looks like that increased gas cost did allow this to go through. And perfect, that means we were able to finish minting our zero with token. So it should have a token ID now. Now, if we go back, I'm gonna go back to my regular browser now. Now, if we go to OpenSea, should be able to pop this address in here. And we do indeed see, we have this random SVG in OpenSea. And you can see we're now no longer on a testnet. We have some results in here. We'll go to the token ID zero because this is the one that we just finished minting. We'll refresh it, refresh the metadata, then we'll refresh the page. And we can see, aha, perfect. We have the SVG. This one's pretty lackluster. It's just a yellow line. Um, we've deployed this to a real network for real money. Now, I know this was a longer video and we went through a ton in this video. And I hope everybody here learned a lot about 
deploying NFTs, working with Hardhat, working with Polygon and everything like that. So definitely be sure to leave your questions in the comments. Definitely be sure to make issues on that GitHub repository if you have any other questions. Fork it, star it, share on Twitter, at me at Patrick Alpha C and say hi. Woo, we went through a ton of stuff here. Now, to close off this video, I just want to give everybody an update with what's been going on. I've, I've missed videos for about a month now, and we're getting very close to 10,000 subscribers. So be sure to subscribe because at 10,000 subs, we're doing a tattoo reveal, which is going to be incredibly fun. So for those of you who've been missing, I've been working on a couple of really big projects, and hopefully very soon, you'll see the fruits of that labor. Be sure to follow me on Twitter so you can stay up to date with the latest and greatest smart contract coding tools, resources, and everything to make you an insanely powerful smart contract engineer. So don't worry, I didn't go anywhere, but there is a fantastic video coming out very soon, and that video will be back in our favorite Python. Hope everybody learned a lot. Be sure to like and subscribe. Let me know in the comments what you want to see next, and we'll talk to you then.